Hey everybody, hope you're keeping well. Bit of a different video today. So me and the guys on the Sparky Ninja webinars, we hosted a webinar on EICR coding fire alarm. So if you follow um, the Sparky Ninja webinars, they've done a series of EICR coding, um, all, di all different topics really, but this one was specifically about fire alarms. Obviously, it's one of my favorite topics. So sit back, hold tight, it is a long one, but there's some really, really interesting points that you may like, so enjoy. <laughs> Okay, no, right. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to the last in 2020's uh, webinar series on EICR coding. We thought we'd end the year with something a little bit different and unique, something that's heavily debated and a, a, a subject that is very passionate with our very own Dan Jackson. And um, we thought we'd deal with fire alarm systems, more importantly, those covered by BS5839 Part 1, not Part 6, which is the domestic. So, we're gonna we're gonna show you how you can code, but Dan's gonna um, offer his uh, and uh, um, afford us his fire alarm knowledge while we play games trying to code these sorts of systems. Um, so we're gonna start by melting your brain. But before we do, um, if any of you guys have Instagram or Twitter or anything like that, our our friend and brother Paul Skirm is fighting a terrible cancer. So if you please can have, if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put the link in the YouTube links. If you're watching this and you've ever been helped by any of us in any way, shape or form or learn anything you wanted to give back, please, can you click on that link and give to his Just Giving page? Um, the man really genuinely needs help and he's a very stubborn, proud Welshman. Um, and it would be really nice if this industry could just give what you can. Um, if you can't afford it, fine. Um, anything would be appreciated. Um, and that's that's really it from, from our little pre-appeal. Um, so should we just crack on and get on with the actual coding itself if this computer mind size yeah, to work for it. i've i've deliberately i mean i looked at the powerpoint when we first kind of put together uh, well the first draft but i've deliberately not gone and revised the standard so i'm going to try and approach this from my limited yes understanding because i don't want to kind of you know obviously dan's our our experienced expert here so i'm going to try to play the uh, the naive um electrician that may not be completely understanding this standard yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to play the naive electrician as well here. Yeah. So for everyone who may be new or learning, or I'm not going to go through the old coding like we've done, please watch those old webinars. Um, everybody knows C1. I can see it. I can touch it. It will kill me now. C1s are dangerous. We try not to walk away from them if we can, or at least issue a danger notification and take some reasonable steps to avoid danger. Uh, we know that the four codes, C1, C2, C3, FI, a C2 is potentially dangerous. Urgent remedial action. Um just something you don't really want uh, to leave on electrical installation and obviously will lead to an unsatisfactory report. C3 improvement recommended, the one that's a hot debate, and I think we'll probably debate it in this webinar as well because some people will have a view on what a C3 is. Um, and also FI further investigation, generally allotted to where there's you're only doing a sampling inspection and test or um, you've just run out of time um, and you're not 100% convinced um, that you've been able to diagnose a fault or find the problem and you recommend further investigation. Um, pretty much three out of the four of them would, would give an unsatisfactory report, um, especially if in my world you get loads of them. Um, in the domestic world, uh, again, it's down to the judgment of the inspector. And the, the purpose of these webinars is to try and help sharpen the, the pencil of the inspector, give them a peer-based, let's review it together as a group of friends and, um, and come up with some engineering debate and reasoning and logic and relate back to some legislation. Now, this is going to be different before I hand over to Dan, because in this uh, webinar, we're not just going to quote 7671. We're going to give you the reasoning behind the British standard that most people can't afford because it's ridiculously expensive. So we're going to tell you the clauses that are in 5839 part one to support our engineering judgment. So, so Paul, it, it, this is for electricians when they're doing EICRs. Yes in properties and they see defects with fire alarm systems. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this, is, this is for a diligent person, um, 37 diligent people who are currently watching at the moment, um, to be able to help improve their coding and observations and their understanding of um, BS5839, which is referenced in, I think it's 110 something it or is, another. It's in. referenced in 110 and we have obviously 560, yes. you know, so, which tells us that we can't ignore 
the safety service and we can't ignore the standards such as 5266 and 5839. We can't just brush past it. Sure. We have to decide whether we're going to take it head on or pass it across and let the client know that that area has not been expertly assessed. Yeah. We've got to do one or the other. Yeah. You know? John, can you keep an eye on the questions? I've just sold your message. And thank you for putting the link in the chat, by the way. Everyone watching on YouTube, but this is a live interactive thing. So part of the interactive experience is lost. Apologies for that. Mm. Um, should we get on? So uh, there's some confusion on codes. Um, Dan, do you want to go in? Do you want to just start by explaining um, uh, this one regulation? Or do you want me to do it? Um, yeah, I mean, th th this regulation is very simple. Um, what is in the book is exactly what you can see on the screen. And it just simply says fire detection and fire alarm systems uh, shall comply with relevant parts of BS 5839 series. So obviously mm -hmm. we've got, you know, different parts, but in this particular one, we're talking about part one, which is generally commercial. I won't confuse too much, but we're talking about commercial systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, if I'm doing the ICR, the purpose of the ECR is to assess compliance with BS7671 and Chapter 56, Safety Services of BS7671 has this regulation and the regulation says, shall comply. Yeah, so the, my, the, 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 natural, the natural work of an EICR makes me have to verify that BS5839 has been complied with. Otherwise, I've got to depart that yeah, and I go um, further with it. What I um, what I've seen that before, you know, I advise a lot of people if you if any parts of seven six seven one, i.e., fire detection systems, that you aren't competent and you're not able to make an assessment, it, you put it in the extent of what your um, report covers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do it with certain things as well, which I'm not too sure about, um, and I think that's really important. However. What I usually do is I will, if I see defects with the firearm systems, even if it's a part six domestic system, I will make a, a, a comment. I will code it, you know, C1, C2, C3, further investigation. But then I will do it, you know, obviously I'll, it's costs involved here, but we'll do a service report on the system because, they're, because 5839 requires a particular, um, you know, there's model forms and what's required during a service. It's a completely different report. Yeah. So I would refer it and push it to another report. Mm. Well, it's mm -hmm. like a supplementary report, isn't it? It's a bit yeah, like exactly, how yeah. it's like how seven nine oh nine has that own report. Five two six six has that own report. The erection of the wiring system of the fire system still relies on seven six seven one. Yeah. You know, things like classification, propagation, penetration of building fabrics. But then you have the defined reporting within five eight three nine. Is that correct? Yeah, and they do they do they do point each other to yeah. towards each other. So wiring generally um, is you know it's supposed to fall under seven six seven one, and then it has some more sort of defined uh, clauses on what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so they are completely interlinked with each other. Both documents. Cool. Can I just add as well? So for those electricians who uh, who have argued it's not in my scope, it's not in your scope. If it's in your agreed scope and limitations, um, then fine. You should be putting that on your certificate each and every time. I'm not including this that, and the other. However, your duty of care, you might have owed to someone um, that if you are doing, you know, uh, inspection of wiring above ceilings, above void, and you see something, would you issue a danger notification notice? And how do you refer it back to a regulation? This is, the, for me, one of the go-to regulations um, for fire alarms. Now, we've said before, and we'll say it again, um, an inspection is the use of the individual inspector's engineering judgment. Now, I have a very simple philosophy uh, where I work, and that is I use those four codes for everything. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's, now, there's no book that says I can't do it, and there's no book that says I can. But what I'm doing is I'm taking an accepted level of risk and a level of coding and applying to anything that works on electrical systems. Dan, Dan you know this as well. The same uh, kind of applies for Dan with fire alarms. But Dan, you have, before we get into the coding bit, you've come up with the coding at the bottom. And um, before anybody uh, says anything, 5839 references you to comply with 7671 and 7671 requires you to comply. So it's a never ending loop of compliance. So the two documents are not separate. But Dan, you've come up with this new system and you've come up with observations. So can we take everybody through your 
your version of this coding system and how it works for you, if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So um, I don't do this on EICR. It will be a yep. separate document which lists out various things you're supposed to check under uh, 5839 part one, mm -hmm. plus an asset register of what we're actually testing, um, plus some other bits and pieces that I put on, a, on a, an inspection form that I created myself and kind of developed over the years. And um, it, it's, a, it just, it's the same stuff that, you know, we're doing a lot of EICRs, we're doing a lot of fire alarm servicing, emergency lighting servicing, and the coding system years ago, it, it's always made sense to code it on severity. Um, and you've, you've used your own engineering judgment to redefine what these codes are. Yes. But with, by matching the intent of what the C1, C2 was. Exactly, yeah. Okay. So um, C1, um it's obviously that's the uh, the danger code if you like it's defects found with the system that prevents the system from functioning to its intended design and or to the relevant british standard um long story short if there were a fire the system isn't going to work we know that which is a danger present which is also a risk of injury and immediate action required which is the original Absolutely. wording of it you can't remember something guys if if you have a fire alarm system that doesn't work go to your insurer and say is my insurance valid if my fire alarm system works i guarantee you they'll turn around and say don't be stupid yeah it's an immediate risk mm. right so we got a c2 which is defects found with the fire alarm system that could prevent the system from functioning to its intended design and or the relevant british standard so it, it's a C1 could be something like um, the panel is not working. It's not on. It, it could mm -hmm. even be the, the battery backup is, uh, or the batteries aren't present or they're not working or something's wrong with, with the system that prevents it from doing what it's supposed to do. But mm -hmm. C2 is something that could it. So again, we're using sort of an engineer in judgment here. We know C1s, it will not work. A lot of the time we're going to have C1s with a firearm system because um, 5839 is quite black or white. Um, so there's going so to be... So would that be a, a damaged loop, for instance, a fault on the fire alarm panel? Because that would that could potentially... It, the system wouldn't operate as a working panel if there's an existing fault and, it, and it's yes. all muted and silenced. And it, it could be something like, which electricians might come across a lot, it could be an earth fault mm. that's on the panel. It doesn't mean it's not working... However, earth faults can prevent um, sort of data interference and it, it could prevent the system from functioning. But again, sometimes you might have earth faults that are actually preventing the system from working. Again, that's why we've got this coding system. It's down to the engineer to figure out um, whether it's not working or it potentially could not be working. So this is your interpretation of potentially dangerous does, immediate remedial action required. Does could does could prevent also refer to the uh, the utilization of the system, such as people being able to access call points if they're blocked off and things. Yeah, absolutely. Or, yeah. yeah. So that again would prevent it being uh, effective. Sure. Yeah. If they're blocking off things like that. Okay. And then a C freeze parts of the system that do not necessarily prevent it from functioning to its intended design and or the relevant British standard but would benefit from improvement for its ongoing use and maintainability. It, this might be something like we have seen um, detectors that are particularly dirty um, and contaminated. And when we test them, they work, they function. However, we're just highlighting here that obviously something's going to go wrong over time. So we're just highlighting it now. But again, if it was something that um, the detectors were contaminated enough that they weren't functioning correctly under a functional test, that would be a C2. Um, right. Sorry, or a C1, sorry. You, you, you raise the severity of the coding. Okay. But if it was something that, you know, we, we might find um, detectors or call points that due, due to environmental or external influences, um, it could be a problem, but it's not a problem right now. So... That's what we're using C3s for. So there's things that may diminish its life as well. Yeah. And, and also just the things like, um, you know, you, you might have um, incorrect sleeving um, and, you know, just stuff that doesn't necessarily meet the standards. However, we're just highlighting it to say that it, it doesn't meet the British standards, but it doesn't okay. mean it's necessarily not working or mm -hmm. could potentially not work. And then we've got um, further investigation. It's the same as, you know, anything else. It's things that um, we need to ascertain things. So it could be, it could be certain 
um, aspects that we need to look into further. Um, if you take over a fire alarm system, you might find that you can't get access to certain parts. Um, and then, because the thing is with fire alarms, you need to understand the design to know if it's actually suitable and fit for purpose. Mm. But most of the time, you will never know that. I mean, the, the times you get paperwork is, I mean, I can, you know, I'm, I'm, most of the properties that I over, um, take over, less than 10% have got any form of paperwork whatsoever. So mm. therefore, we have to revert back to the client and say, have you got a specification? Um, what's your requirement? What's your insurance? Blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. we kind of work it out like that. I guess over time you may take over the maintainer of an exist of a new client and they may have an existing fire system in place that's been in place for eight to 10 years, but three yeah. or four years ago, they changed the layout of their building. And so yeah. the, so, but the zones weren't adjusted to suit. Well, well, actually Dave, that is um, part of the maintenance uh, inspection schedule in mm. 5839 part one. Right. So how many people do that? It's, it's part of the, it's what you're supposed to be doing. It's on model forms, it's in the standard. So okay. if, you, if you come in, and that's why when you take over fire alarm system on day one, um, it, it's what we call a special inspection rather than just squirting some smoke up and testing the call points. It's a special inspection. We're highlighting any defects. So it's, it takes a little bit longer. Um, we need to know a little bit more from the client as well. And if you get no information from the client, you have to go back to basics and assume the system is supposed to conform to everything we, we look at in 5839 part one. This is where it gets, it does get tricky. Um, but things like um, if I was doing a special, you know, a special inspection and there was a room where it didn't have detection, I would be highlighting that and saying, well, that's a C1 because we're supposed to, you know, it's supposed to be, um, you know, an L2 system. This room's supposed to have detection. There's no detection in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's, let's just go into the observation and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of show you exactly what we mean in the pictures and the coding, because this is where it's going to get really fun. Observation, Dan, that's a new one. Or is it a new one? So I've, again, I've used this for years when I've done um, EICR code and I even do it now. I just write, um, you know, OBS as a general comment because I find anything that's in the uh, comment section on an EICR tends to get completely ignored and not looked at. So mm -hmm. I would tend to write stuff in here that isn't codable, but we're just highlighting it. It could be um, the, the keys are, axed, um, are located in this room, or this is something, the conditions mm -hmm. when I tested, this is what was happening on the site at the time. So I just put OBS. It's just something I've done for a so long it's, time. It's a comment, but it's not a it's codable a comment. comment. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, well, there's nothing stopping the engineer using his judgment to do that and call, calling it what he wants. Remember, the framework of 7671 is the minimum based on compliance to BS 7671. 7671 says, you know, the installation should comply with 5839. There's nothing stopping you using your own engineering judgment working from that document. Now, on the screen, we've got, we got screenshots of what 5839 part one, that's what we're going to predominantly look at which costs many hundreds of the Queen's pounds. 5839 part six, we'll probably come on to and do one on that's, next year because that's a whole different world yeah. of problems. Can I just right. explain also, there's a, at the bottom of this um, commentary of the OBS here, we've yeah. put this includes listed and agreed variations or risk assessment that input into the suitability of the design. Now, what this means is when you install, well, when you design a fire alarm system, you might have variations or um, departures you know from the the standards um now i think it's important to highlight those on a, a maintenance report to acknowledge to the client that you've recognized them and then noted instead of it just completely being ignored so um, a client might agree a variation like um in a bar for example they might not want a call point on the final exit however mm -hmm. we've got one behind the bar for staff that, that might be a variation, but we're just highlighting it as an option. It's not a code, it's not a defect, but we're just saying, so when the next man comes along, or woman, who does the test, we're highlighting everything we possibly can. And would you attach the risk assessment if there was one with that to that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the practice of sharing risk assessments needs to massively improve across the supply chain. Um, to want to show you. And, and that guy down below looking really confused, that's the client. Now, the client, this is one of the reasons why I think using the codes to create your own framework for not just 7671 
isn't necessarily a bad I, I, way of working because mm -hmm. if you can teach your client four codes with some observations, they will use that. They will learn that. Dan, you know exactly where I'm going with that. You can use these codes to work from a British standard to exercise your engineering judgment on any system that's electrical. Um, and, and the beauty is because these standards are all intertwined, it's not hard and it would make an interesting debate with a judge. Not that I'd ever want that debate, no. but I'm pretty sure that having thought this and exercised it, I could demonstrate that I've taken a reasonably practicable step to discharge the duty that I owe to the confused clients and also a client who's taught by the supplier, they'll, they'll build a trust and a relationship where they'll go, you're my go-to guy because you're, you're de-risking my business. So this is, this is the reason why we're focusing on the commercial side in this webinar. Right. Should we get into the pictures? Oh no, not yet. Sorry. There's a commentary. Dan, do you want to do the commentary bit first? Right, so this is um, in uh, BS 5839 part one, and I just wanted to read this out because the, within the fire industry, there seems to be a massive confusion over this. So um, if I just read it out, routine yeah. servicing of a fire, fire detection and alarm system does not constitute as a fresh review of system design. It is a verification of the functionality and serviceability of the existing system. Accordingly, it's not necessarily the case that non-compliances of the standard will be identified at the time of the routine servicing. In any case, the maintenance technician might not want, might not be aware of whether the apparent non-compliant is in fact an agreed variation. So what we're saying here is that when you do a service visit, you're not doing a verification of the design. That's what this is saying. Mm. And it's saying the, the service engineer might not know the design, but my argument is if he doesn't know the design, how can you verify if it's okay? Yeah. Like you, you need to, and this is, this, this is the point of the initial uh, takeover visit. It's really important because the standard is written in a way that, mm. and um, you know, Will might comment on this, um, but the standard is written in a way under the assumption that any system installed is to the standards, but we know they are not. So you can't, and you know, to be fair, seven six seven one does as well. When you're inspection and testing, it's based on the assumption that the the system installed met the standard, but we know it doesn't. That's why you have to use your engineering judgment here, because what a lot of companies do, they take over systems, and they just test in detectors and call points and say yes, they work. But it doesn't yeah. mean it's a fit for purpose system. I agree. They they always go. They always give you um, the one page this is the functionality proven, that's your servicing. Um, but if you're a client that's not aware of your duty to maintain these systems and also a client that isn't, doesn't exercise change control on a building, you may have had a construction project two years ago, do modifications to the alarm system temporarily, which have now become permanent. And as, as you'll see from these photos, temporary can be easily permanent, made permanent and then become a codable lash up, which puts the entire system at risk. And also lack of documentation. If there's any alterations to systems, where's the documentation? Right. Mm. Mm. Sure? <clears throat> so it says here, however, at their own prerogative, the maintenance organization can point out aspects of non-compliance. Yes. So is there, is, there, <laughs> is, is there any actual instrument that says the design must be reassessed or reapplied or redone? Um, this at, is an, the, at an interval. This is the only commentary on, oh. on what we're talking about. So the, the last bit, nevertheless, any such advice provided to the user by the maintenance organization cannot be regarded by users enforcing authorities or any other party as an implication that the maintenance technician has identified or has endeavored to identify all such areas of non-compliance or that there has been any review of the original design. That scares the hell out of me because yeah. that's a get out of jail clause for in 5839, whereas a lot of clients will employ a, a comp, what they believe is a competent contractor to keep them safe, not just the functionality, but also identify any gaps of risk. Maybe some won't, but with fire as hot as it is now, pardon the pun, yeah. um, it's, um, it's, it's something that all clients need to be absolutely bang on. We're fully compliant 5839. So a gap analysis of what I have against the standard, if you're a client watching this, or if you know a client, I'd recommend it every single time. Because, Paul, what, what a, lot of, um, a lot of people, when I've done training and stuff like that in the past, have said to me, um, systems that are installed say 20 years ago you're not you're not testing and inspecting to today's standard you're in you you know obviously they were installed as they were back then but then if, again if you've got no design information or no uh, current risk assessment by by the client 
that's all very well, but you haven't necessarily met the regulatory reform order because you're not, you, you haven't necessarily got a system that is actually fit for purpose that's going to function in the event of a fire. So I would always go use this commentary here to basically pretty much do a, a review of the design, even though it says contradictory, you shouldn't do that. Okay, doke. Right, moving on. So we're now we're into, we're now into the coding. You're an inspector. Um, we're going to leave both sets of codes on the screen just so that you can navigate it and understand and absorb. Dan's one is working from the regulations. We can you can use whichever one you want, but the, for the purposes of coding, which I'm going to launch a poll now. Here we go, drum roll. So hopefully you'll see a code. If everyone can see that, just move that across. Um, take a vote what would you what would you code that as an inspector of an electrical installation just walking on by you see that it looks like there's some obviously some thermal effects there it's a through box interesting coding coming through I'll so, I mean um, the, I, I don't know where this photo come from but obviously yeah it looks like might be one of the ones I was sent I think yeah, that looks like a heat has been on it or something, doesn't it? Some, I think, I think it was. There was, a, if I remember rightly, there was a nearby, there was a fire nearby, and I think a lot of work had been done, but I don't think people realised the conductivity of the fire, and hadn't checked the, you know, they checked the immediate vicinity, but not adjacent. Yeah, moved a little bit further out because that's obviously there's some thermal effects there that's that's done that. Um, right, I'm going to give you five more seconds to poll. So 27 people, 28. Come on, guys. See if we can get all, all of you voting. Just a quick question, Dan, while people are voting for this. Yeah. The the term special inspection, I'm just looking at 46.2, which someone in chat's kind of pushed on to. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there an understanding of its def, of its intent or defi, definition? Because I'm not seeing anything in 5039 itself. I mean, what what when it says the term a special inspection? So, um, yeah, 46.2 is a special inspection on the appointment of the new servicing organisation. So that's, you're taking over? You're taking over a system. Yeah. And is that, does that, is that what drives you to carry out a reassessment of the design yeah. and the suitability of the existing? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. And okay. Um, what you're supposed to, I mean, it does define it in there. It, it says major of non-compliance. Um, and it does say pretty much what we've been talking about there but a lot of companies they do miss this off do miss this they yeah. just take they just take ownership of the existing strategy yeah and you, you imagine if you've got an organization that takes over i don't know 300 400 properties yeah okay it's a big old slog it, it, you know it's a lot of hard work in the beginning yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no I, I can understand that yeah that's interesting 15 more seconds to vote guys and then we're going to close the poll um so what do you guys think on on the coding front so let's pretend it's still working, worst case scenario. I mean, yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to look at the cause of this, uh, suitability of the detector for the environment. If this is a, let's say, let's say a worker's been in with hot works and it's created that, that just needs to be replaced. If there's another reason, it needs to be redesigned to suit that external influence, if that's a normal influence. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with a C2, potentially dangerous urgent remedial action. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I've got your dad in my head <laughs> in fire life safety system C2. Um, it would take, it would take a, a very rare occasion for me to go into the world of C3 when it comes to fire. And well, I'm going to end the poll. In my mind, I'm double coding though, because I'm C2ing it, but I want FI to find out the cause. Yeah. Oof. It's like, Ooh. it's like, it's like that time. I'll do what I did, FIing everything. You'll it's get like that account. time. Remember when we did the one with uh, Richard Townsend? We said about the plastic yeah. under the ch under table. We can't just replace it. We've yeah. got to look at the cause of this. So C2 immediately and then an FI to actually then figure out what the yeah, cause is. I mean, most is. of these probably FI, you can probably put FI on pretty much everything if you want, but uh, obviously, I mean, this one, it's obviously melted. So uh, yeah. clearly it needs to be replaced. Even if it is still working, that's not really the point. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we don't want to be FIing everything because you'll get a reputation for being me on the first one. Do you remember, I FI'd everything, and everyone was calling me the king of FI. Um, mm. So the the poll's finished, and I will share the results. Um, and it's fifty eight percent C two. Well done. Um, Sixteen percent um, FI. C one twenty six percent. Do you know what? I don't disagree. At the end of the day, it's it's it's. I think if it worked, yes. If it didn't work, yeah, I can understand the C1s completely. Um, but remember, 560.10.
So if you see stuff like this, 56010 simples, um, you can then reference, cross-reference 5839. But let's see if this works. Oh, look at this. We've even got the regulation. Dan, do you want to read it? Yeah, so 45.4b, uh, all automatic fire detectors and remote detectors should be examined as far as practicable to ensure they have not been damaged, painted or otherwise adversely affected. Thereafter, every detector should be functionally tested. Personally, I would put this as a C1 because oh, it's been wow. damaged. Because what? Because it's been damaged. And if you, go, if you talk to a manufacturer and say, where's your stance on this with this detector? Can you guarantee it works? Even if it's functionally tested and it does operate, I guarantee you they'll say replace it. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 thanks for making me feel very incompetent there. God bless you. But yes, um, yeah, okay. Okay, so I think that was pretty good. 58% um, C2, 26% um, agree with Dan. So there you go, 45.4B. Right, let's move on to the next one. Holy mother of... I see this too many times. <sighs> yeah. Yes. Right. So we've got, obviously, we've got multiple issues here, haven't we? We've got... Um, you know, we've got LV cables mixed with the fire alarm cables. Um, we've got no clipping, you know. And how many times do you look up above the ceiling and it looks like this? That's yeah. a retail shop, isn't it? It's a suit shop. Um, yeah. That's just awful. And you're right, I've been, in, mm. I've been in local suit shops to where I live and the electrics there are dire and nothing's compliant. Everything's lassoed across ceilings. Mm. Um, this goes back to Paul's point earlier on about, okay, an electrician might be doing an EICR he may have removed the scope of the fire due to a lack of understanding of the technical standard of 5839. The client is informed of that. But if you pop your head up to maybe take a ZS from the ceiling rows or the click roses for the luminaires and you see this, is it within your remit if you've excluded it from your scope as a wiring system? Or should we actually still pass it as an observation maybe to inform the client? Yeah, because... launch the poll. Start voting everyone. Um... Because regardless, Dave, um, whether it was fire alarm or security or whatever, yep. we have got premature collapse. Um, we do. We do, yeah. Premature collapse, indeed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, premature there's a few in there, fire, isn't there? Fire stopping. Yeah. All sorts, all sorts of yeah, other issues. Stopping, yeah. and, the, and the thing is with FP, because it is fire rated, during a fire, what it does, it swells up and goes all chunky and brown and crispy on the outside, but it don't snap. So you're going to have like a rope hanging across that ceiling if that wasn't clipped during a fire. I've seen it so many times. It just, and it, it, it still functions. And obviously, um, all small data cables, they mm. are, you know, in a flaming inferno. They do just break and, you know, disintegrate. But FP, it stays there. And it is a trip hazard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I think most of the people vote. We'll give you another 30 seconds, guys. Um, what do you think? Um, it's storming ahead on one code. What do you guys think? think from coding perspective um i'm gonna yeah. go c2 i'd say c2 at least i mean just yeah, from the yes. fact that you've got all those unsupported cables hanging on the back of the ceiling and suspended ceilings are not designed to support the weight of cables or no. anything else apart from themselves so no. c2 just because of that mm -hmm. that's what dan tells us is a c1 probably probably <laughs> but say what, there, dan, what's, your, what's, your code? There, so. what, what's my code yeah, yeah. come on I put it as a C1 because okay. it doesn't meet the requirements of BS5839 Part 1. Dave? Okay. Your card? Well, your again, code? again, I think seven, it was 7671. I'm at C2, potentially to C1 with 5839. Um, I'll agree, I, I, I'd agree with Dan. He's the expert on this one. Um, but yeah, um, I see it's potentially dangerous. If any of this affects the performance of the system, then it would be a C1. Um, my, again, my experience of fire systems isn't as much as Dan's. If he can conclude to me or tell me that that is affecting its performance and its reliability, then I'd see one it. You've got other things. Okay. I mean, that, that pink at the top right there is presumably that fire-resistant plasterboard, and obviously where it's joined together, <laughs> there's a huge yeah. gap between the two bits, so it's going to do nothing. I'm it's sure that's a fully flame compliant just goes straight through there and uh, destroy whatever's on the other side of it. Well, here's the results. So the results are in, and it's 88% C2. 3% C1 and 9% C3. Now, I wish I think we've made a mistake here. Where you've got observation on the bottom left of the screen, we should have deleted the O and just came up with a code called BS because that is utter bullshit. Ockingly bad <laughs> stuff. 
Um, it's yes. It, um, I'm just reading the comments here, people are saying C2 um, could be prevented from working. But what you've got to remember here is that system is to maintain the fire integrity of either standard or enhanced. So if we talk about standard, we're talking 30 minutes fire rating. Now, um, the idea is, is that the cables are supposed to be intact and kept there. We've got multiple problems here. We've got mechanical um, stresses because cables could be pulled. Um, they could be damaged. We've got a uh, premature collapse. We've also got, um, we could have interference here, which I have put on, um, you know, this, the comments here on 26.2 to avoid electromagnetic interference with fire alarm signals. Again, if you speak to manufacturers and you say um, they'll issue, they've got some wiring um, data information about how you wire these circuits. Now, anybody who's installed a twin, twin flex system, which a lot of electricians have, well, no, if you run the fire alarm cables next to LV cables, quite often you do get interference and they don't function how they're supposed to. So we're not following manufacturer's instructions either. No, and, and just, so just, on, uh, just to, to mop this up now, we could have filled the screen with regs on this, but what we've done is, is again, 56010, that's the go-to, you will comply with 5839. Nowhere in 5839, I really hope Dan's going to, does it say thou shall lash it in? with um, no regard for anything. So we've looked at avoiding the risk of mechanical damage to fire alarm. Um, we've also looked at electromagnetic interference. And if you still want more, um, 521.10.202, which is the UK regulation for premature collapse. There you go. There's a premature collapse regulation. So that's four parts of two standards that tells you straight away that is unacceptable junk. Okay, so, so Dan, right? The requirement of 5839 is to ensure that the wiring system will actually maintain its integrity for how long in a fire? Um, if it's a standard um, system, we're talking 30 minutes, 120 okay. for enhanced. And so we could assume that that could be a fire underneath that ceiling point that's yeah. dropping all that ceiling. So if that wiring system is not fixed in a way that's going to you know, help maintain its integrity, I can see where there could be a C1 area with that for me as well. Yeah. And, and right. again, Dave, I think a lot of people will argue with me on that, which is fine, but the, you wouldn't install it like that on day one. And that's, no. not, that's not something that's just been degraded over time. That it's, was installed it's, like that. I think it's a case of trying to understand the conditions which the wiring system is supposed to actually be designed for. Yeah. Having FP alone doesn't automatically mean it's completely impervious to a fire incident if the structure and everything else is going to collapse around that and pull it down or damage it isn't it so for, for years we've installed fp or fire rated cabling whatever you want to install mm. and we don't just um you know put clips every one meter we install them to manufacturers instructions and we install them to make sure that the fire integrity is maintained i.e we want to keep those cables clipped to this building um fabric so it stays there and does its job. So, the thing, so it, obviously, it, if a fire um, happens, occurs, and cables start expanding, things start moving within the building, we want to keep the cable still. We don't want them to start pulling out mechanical, you know, mechanical stress because they're, um, you know, and also things like maintenance. The amount of times that I've, I've had where we've had cables pulled out where someone's got their hand above the ceiling trying to pull some new alarm cables and whatever, and they damaged the fire alarm system. I think, I think it's like, like I identify when I did the webinar with my old man is we don't understand enough how firefighters tackle fires and how fire behaves with the way it damages the structure which our wiring system is erected on. Yeah. And if our wiring system requires the electrical connections to actually be sustainable for the duration of that, uh, I think that's something that is lost with a lot of electricians when they design these systems. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have another look at 5839 to see what it kind of gives me with that. Cause that might help. Good chaps. Moving on. We're on the next one. So all right. I'm, I'm going to push these along cause there's 176 slides. Well, we don't have to do all of them. Do no, we? there isn't. No, there isn't. I'm just joking. I just want to <laughs> okay. keep this going. Um, next one. Um, I think the person's middle in finger, um, kind of indicates the challenge here. Um, and I'm going to relaunch the poll to what people think of this and how would you code this? Evidently, uh, um, a replacement system. Yeah, it looks like it's going from steel conduit system to plastic. Joy, hmm. quality there, eh? 
Now, uh, again, I mean, sorry, but should there not be Psycho 5839 that would say if you're going to upgrade, you have to remove any other parts of the system that may confuse the operators? Actually, um, well, I have put something that. on here. Yeah, yeah, we'll get onto that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's so, get onto it. Let's get onto it. Um, what, what do you think? I'm going to be a bit brutal here. What, right, just looking at that, um, let's assume that the system is being replaced and the old one will be ripped out, possibly, or, well, maybe not actually. So I see that. It just says yeah, that. Yeah, no, not in use. Well, we'll, we'll assume it is, but um, it's a great indicator of making sure that your your call points, your, uh, are, your help points, sorry, are um, and, and accessible. The purpose of the call point is to raise the alarm manually. Yes. So we have got um, smoke detectors, but... Again, when you've got a fire, depends on what type of system you've got. This might this might be a manual only system, so yep. we might not have smoke detectors here. Yeah, but it's evident awesome. here if there were a fire, and bear in mind there's a fire, people are panicking, they're screaming or whatever. It, you know, it, you know, it's not like we are now where we're calm and collective. You want to act quickly, and if they can't act quickly, do you think they're going to operate the fire alarm and save everybody else in the building? Mm. Yeah. Possibly not. Right, well, there's still six, six, seven people haven't voted. So please vote if you can in the next few seconds. Um, I'm going to start off by saying I think that's uh, a C2. Um, what, what do you think? I know who sent in this photo. Or a friend well, I'm going to say it's a C1 it. because it can't, it's not working, is it? You can't use it. So, I mean, it's, it might as well not be yeah. there because you can't actually activate the thing if, there is, if you need to. So. <clears throat> well, that guy can get his middle finger in there. Mm. To an extent, I think maybe that's why he's using his middle finger. Um, there's a lot of questions around. I, I'd see to it, FI it, um, without a doubt, just just as part of my duty of care. I'd note it on a certificate and wait 15 years for somebody else to probably know it. So, oh, that, yeah, that needs to be done. But I would, um, I'd at least see to it and FI it. Um, I'm going to end this poll. Okay. And display the results. And the poll had. Uh, C1, 46%, real, oh, it's a good good mix. C2, 43%, um, and 11% C3. Interesting. Do you know what? I, I, I can't actually, because it's fire, I can't disagree with all of them, but your dad in my head says anything fire. Um, okay, if, if the story was, yes, it's being ripped out, then, yeah, maybe C3, if it was still not commissioned, etc., then fair enough, but... Yeah, there are there are questions to be asked of this. Um, Dan, is is there anything in this in the fire industry that says there's more risk here if you didn't have automatic detection than if you didn't? So if I had automatic detection in the same room, would there be a lesser concern here? Um, I think they serve different purposes, um, right? Because I mean, I've always been taught the best fire detectors are people. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes. But, I mean, automatic can fail, can't it? Fundamentally. Of course it can. And the thing is, you might have um, a kitchen that's caught on fire and it's, or at the st early stages of fire where it's forming smoke, but it doesn't mm. necessarily mean the heat detector is going to go off. So in yeah. that instance here, let's say that was, was in that scenario, the quicker thing is going to be pressing that call point. And if, you, if you're struggling, you, is, fires are all about reaction. You want to, you want to get people out and you want to get the fire and rescue to the premises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're delaying time here by blocking it. Now, if that didn't have a cover on, I wouldn't say it's a problem. Um, other than I would note down that, you know, that that call point not in use, it's not a durable label, um, and how long is it, you know, is it going to be there? Because I have seen instances where this has been left like it for five years. <laughs> would, 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 you, would you as the engineer not be duty bound to block this off at least or blank it off or make it so it doesn't look right, that tape so, can just fall off so yeah yeah i mean there's um i can't remember exactly what clause it is i think that we've, we've written it another one but okay. there there is a clause to say all call points should um be the same type throughout um now this is obviously where we're doing a change over system so we're taking one out and we're putting a new one back in yeah there's i've, I've been I've just, in, in fact, we just installed a system where they wanted the old bells kept in place because they're huge. They're about 250 mil wide and the redecoration cost is, is you know, ridiculous for this client. So um, they want the bells kept there. So we've put it down on the drawings to say that there is redundant equipment. But really, I'd like to see it removed. And I can't find anything in the standard that says they have to be removed. 
Interesting. Dave, what was your code for this? Again, uh, immediate C2, but if, if that is not functionally operational, then C1, if you cannot mm. operate the system. Um, I think the clauses in 5839 are quite good ones as well. For mm. 453, all manual call points remain unobstructed and conspicuous. And also 20.2, all manual call points should be fitted with protective cover, which is moved to gain access to the frangible element, which is another word for your book, Dave. Yeah, frangible. Let's just, just stick there in as many times as we can. I like like these fancy words. Okay, let's um let's move on, guys. Uh, here's a classic. Yeah. Well, yeah, we've already heard about not painting. It says it even says do not paint on it, doesn't it? So let's get into the poll. And while the polls are up, actually, I think Jono's put a, um, a comment in here. Ooh, that, um, it's a big no-no to paint FP. And so when you go to the manufacturers, when, when we've looked into this before, I was, uh, Eddie actually sent me, from Pegasus, sent me mm. a, an article. And it's from a manufacturer. And it says that they haven't tested FP cables under under fire condition when they're painted so therefore they cannot say if they will function under 5839 part one if they're painted wow and um a very well-known uh, domestic smoke alarm company recently i had a, a tenant who put a sticker over the sounder and i i said i just called him up at, you know and said what's your take on this a tenant has, has put a sticker on but um it no, sorry, over the LED light because she was trying to sleep and she's saying it's distracting her sleep with the LED light on. Yes. It's not the sound. It's not, it doesn't affect the detector, but they said because it hasn't been tested over those, um, over those conditions, they can't confirm if it will work or not. Mm, John has put the link in there to uh, one of Prismium's oh, okay, articles. Okay. Cheers, John. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. Right. Well, let's in the poll. Let me show you the results. Resounding C2 uh, with 58%, C1, 30%. Now, Dan said about 20 10%. minutes ago, it's a C1 if the manufacturer's going to say it don't work. So I'm thinking, hang on, is, C, is it C1, Dan? I personally would put it as C1 because it says okay. do not paint. And again, there's... You mean that the fact that they've painted over do not paint? <laughs> there's a bit of irony in that. Um, mm. For me, I mean, I'd want to look at the rest of the detector but if the rest of the detector had paint splashed on it, yes, it would be a C1. Um, if I can't imagine them taking it down and painting it, so I'm going to assume some must, idiot yeah. painted over all of it. To be honest with you, I mean, there must be a there reason. The man, if the manufacturer is going to say don't paint it, then there must be a consequence to the device, to the system. So yeah, I'm comfortable with the idea of C1ing those things because again. Um, when you look into actually testing, uh, I mean, this is a heat, but when you look into the testing of detectors, it's mm. really quite complex. It's not, it's not straightforward. Um, detector testers are a really good company to speak to because pretty much they own the market on test equipment and um, they know how to test every t single detector and, you know, what, what's best. Now, what a lot of people do is they use, you know, uh, smoke cans and they spray the hell out of detectors and it contaminates them. But when you speak to, um, you know, the manufacturers and the manufacturer of test equipment, it's a very different story to doing that. I have heard that, that those methods of testing, some manufacturers don't like some of those. Yeah. I yeah. They, so yeah. It, it's, it's more complex than what people may believe. I mean, this is a heat. So you put a, yeah. you know, a heat gun on um, a heat tester on it. But again, the reason I would see one is simply because um, it, it's, the manufacturers do it under certain test conditions. We don't know how that's going to be affected by that paint. It might sp you might spray it. It might work. The, the, you know, the electrical um, you know, effects of it will actually function, but we don't know if it's going to test in a fire. Mm -hmm. It's going to work in a fire. So, so I'm, going C1. I'm going C1. Dan, you're on C1. Dave, what are you on? Again, Dan's just mentioned it in a fire. So now I'm thinking if I paint it, I'm going to cover it in this material that the fire might then create some fumigation or some kind of other impact yeah. that might compromise the device's effectiveness. So who am I to say otherwise to what a manufacturer would say? Okay. So I'd, I mean, in fire systems, you, I mean, you have to always follow the manufacturers with this. I mean, you'd be very brave to leave the manufacturer's guidance. 
I'm thinking a fire condition might compromise the detector if it's covered in paint, because obviously the paint will react differently. The detector will respond differently. Uh, so I'd, I'd happily push this to C1, but I would want to do a little bit of literature and research to back that up. So I don't sound like an idiot, because I don't quite know how um, I'd write um, it down right now. John, are you are you going C1? Yeah, I think C1. I mean, this, this thing about painting stuff does definitely have unintended consequences, particularly mm. if you paint certain things with certain other things. I mean, if you... There used to be a public information film in the 1970s about painting polystyrene tiles on the ceiling. So if you put polystyrene tiles on the ceiling, that's fine. Yeah. Paint your ceiling, that's fine. But if you paint polystyrene tiles with gloss paint, there's some kind of reaction occurs and it turns into a massive fire hazard. So yeah. that's just another example of sort of unintended consequences of two things that are safe on their own, but stick them together and then it's turned into a complete disaster. So. Yeah. For a manufacturer to actually put a label on it, do not paint, mm. tells you that there's some science behind this. <laughs> yeah, and, and also with fire safety, electricians, we normally think about thermal and magnetic effects. With fire, it's very much thermal and chemical, chemical effects as well, and transmission of fire and all that good stuff. So it's, it's a little different mindset. But again, 56010, if you were to code it, um, if somebody had painted paint all over it, I would, I would see one it because I'd say, look, your fire alarm system, Ain't work. You're only insured. To me, it's immediately dangerous because there is a fire and it doesn't detect. There you go. Um, but in five eight three nine, God love them. Forty five point four B. All automatic fire detectors, remote detectors, should be examined as far as practicable. Well, if you're there, it is practicable. If you're a competent person who knows, you know, he's got a twenty twenty vision, to ensure they've not been damaged, painted, or otherwise adversely affected thereafter. Every detector should be functionally tested. Now, if you're not there to functionally test it, that's fine. But you are there to make observations on the installation. Remember, five six zero ten, uh, best endeavours. You know you can make it a one liner, um, yeah. and if the client says it's not in your scope, then fine. Issue a danger notification, and just yeah. say you know duty of care, take all reasonable steps. I've noted five sixty point ten is not complied with. No one is going to criticise you for that, and if they do, then you can have a very interesting conversation with both sets of British standards in their duty of care road. Right, moving on. Oh, we've got another one. This is, this is just another one. It is another one. Okay. Um, again, I, I, yeah, so this is the exact same one, but heavily painted over. So it's even more paint debris. There you go. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. Let's run the poll for this bad boy. What's that? Well, first of all, the label. The label is just this the wrong. It's UV faded. Um, yeah. yeah, screws are horizontal, not vertical. <laughs> That's wrong. <laughs> See, see, I find this an interesting <laughs> one because um, a lot of fire alarm technicians, engineers or operatives or whatever, a lot of them aren't too familiar with 7671. Yeah. So I, I've become aware of this. Uh, I can't, I, I've noticed a lot of people who are electricians that do fire only do a bit of fire such as they'll set it off and they'll mute it and they'll check the zone and they'll use the spray or the things... Yeah. But I don't see them going down any other areas. You I mean, like like we're going down here. And then the flip side is a lot of guys in fire don't come over to 7671. There really is this kind of line in the sand which they're either side of right now. Strange. Yeah, I'm going to go with C1. I don't know why, but I'll see one button's disappeared off the screen. Um, don't ask me why. <laughs> There's glitches in the matrix uh, in the internet. Um, but yeah, I'm going to go C1 with this. This is access to live parts. This is just really dumb. Um, to be perfectly frank, what, what was your views, Dave, Dan, John? Well, I think, I mean, obviously, live parts is a C1. In terms of the fire alarm actually working, I mean, it's still going to work, but obviously, you've got live bits hanging out. And also, I've questioned who the hell is Rich Star in terms of the views manufacturer? I mean, is that a reputable brand from a quality source? <laughs> yeah, that's, um, that's I mean, in the Western Hemisphere of Taiwan. Um, so, John, if you've not heard of them, then we're, we're, then we're, we're, uh, <laughs> screwed. we're in trouble. <laughs> 32 out of 39 haven't voted. Come on, guys, this is an obvious one, although probably some of you may be busy, but I'm going to end this poll in about 10 seconds. Dan, is it C1 for you? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Right, I think we're, we're all kind of agreed. I'm going to end this poll now. And I'm sharing the results. And lo and behold, it's a clean sweep. 100% of us all believe it's absolutely, yeah, I mean, non-contact detector there. 34 people have voted on that one. Yep. So absolutely without the live parts it's broken so i mean it needs to be replaced doesn't it it's, it's clearly not working as it intended so 
to see one and i think we have so this is this is one where we could go off and off and off and off and off and off and one for ages but what we've done is we've just quoted again if you want this is for your knowledge um 5839 25.2 c to facilitate local isolation means uh, suitable means should be provided for local isolation of lv supply circuit the, uh, so my, my point with this one paul is that this is the clause in British standard to say that local isolation um, should be available. Yeah. How do you provide local isolation, safe isolation, if you're using this type of spur? How do you, you do don't. It? That's a death no. trap. That's a local death sentence. That is. So if you if you had um, say like um, I don't know like an MK uh, fuse holder, you can actually get padlocks that can go through the fuse holder. So yeah. you're not just relying on taking the fuse out because obviously someone can just re-energize that by putting it back on. But if you use an isolator where it cannot be re-energized without use of like a lock off, that's what should be used as a fire alarm isolator. Yeah, so pretty much now is it down to MK, doesn't it? Because that's with a little hole yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, so we've got MK um, and, you know, there is a requirement for isolators, um, i.e., they, I mean, we've got the standard 7671 stuff, but we're also supposed to make sure that they're either red or labelled fire alarm. So you can put a label on it like this, but you've got to make sure that you can carry out safe isolation via local isolation. Obviously, on this spur, you can't. So regardless of, you know, we wouldn't replace this like for like. We'd put another isolator in that, that meets the requirements. Yeah. I'm not a fan of these types of isolators anyway, to be perfectly frank. Um, for me, that's not a controlled system using one of those types of spurs. Um, maybe I'm old fashioned. Side, but um, whoever broke that fuse drawer out, how do they get the fuse in there without getting a shock off of it? Oh, you're just being pedantic now, John. I mean, to press that in there, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, what, that's what you can buy brown trousers for, John. It's, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I don't disagree. Probably a pair of long nose pliers and a whole dose of stupidity. Yeah, Will's just added in the chat there, uh, clause 25 ends with, it should be possible to lock the facilities in both the normal and isolate positions to prevent unauthorised use. Yeah, I mean, we've only put a little bit of clause 25 in because you can, this 5839 has a lot more than what yeah, yeah, 671 yeah. does is in common sense. But again, safe isolation required under EWR, you know, we can go into 12, we can go into 4, we can go into any part of the AWR mm -hmm. we want. Um, again, it says in section 45, inspection and services, the AWR, kind of safe isolation is carried out. That's not safe isolation. You can link that to a statutory obligation. But in fairness, if you actually do your work with your coding and you understand the intent of the regulations, you should always be able to create a line of sight up to the legislative obligation. Um, we will do a webinar on that next year. And we're going to cover chapter 13 just as an example to show you how our mindset works with creating a line of sight with what we call the hierarchy of legislation. So that will be next year's um, webinar. Right, I'll see one pop back in, great. Yay. What the hell <coughs> is this? Oof, someone paid a lot of money for that. We've got, um, we've got a call point here where the brake glass has been broken and what they've done is they've turned it around and put it back in place so it doesn't constantly go into fire. Very lazy, right? So there's bits missing, presumably. Then. So it's not. It's not. It's not it, working not, then. Not missing. No, it... what, what? 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 It is. So that that brake glass has basically been broken, yeah. and they've just turned it around. So in theory, you could press that, and it will go off. Okay. But obviously, it's um, again. But are we supposed to have the instruction press here on these? Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember what clause it is. But... You get your sharpie out and write it on there. Would that be okay then? Yeah. <laughs> but it's to indicate the, the point that you press mm -hmm. to activate the alarm. Um, and obviously it's, you know, it's signage, if you like. Um, and it, it's important during fire, we need signage. We need clear instructions or what we need to do. Mm. So, um, so this one, um, yeah. Oh, the manufacturer question. happy with that? <laughs> oh, do you know what Dave I've never asked but um... what genius came up with the red trunking I say that massively sarcastically by the way <laughs> but seriously somebody it's thought it was good to get a bit of M MT2 and colour it red like that would make that install look any neater or nicer 
I mean, the idea of the trunk is to tidy it up a little bit. <laughs> but that, uh, an architect, well, I don't, know, I don't know any architect that would love that, although in I've, fairness... Yeah, I've yeah. only ever heard one person argue in its favour, and, and they, 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 they screamed at the point that we want to have the wiring system dedicated for that wiring system, and if it's red, it means electricians won't use it for other systems. Um, you, what else could you put in OMT2 other than that cable, though? You know, you can't put... You're not, no one else is going to use it. No, I know. I just don't see the point. In it. I don't it's, know. Red, it's, it's a bit... It is pig ugly. Yeah. Maybe I'm just being pedantic. Right, well, listen, well, I'll end the poll now anyway, because everybody's voted, and I will share it on the screen. And the poll has 35% of people saying it's a C1, um, danger present. Um, C2, um, it's potentially dangerous, and th which was 57%. C3, 3%. And 5% said FI, they would want further investigation. Yeah. Um, That's probably who the idiot is that done that. I mean, something I can see in the image is this is right next to a fire door. Yeah. So this is the point of exit of the building. It looks, yeah, it looks, it's, uh, yeah. So the, this, this, this kind of core point really should have no ambiguity about how it's used. Yeah. And but, that, because to, look, to me, that increases the risk a little bit. That it is the one that you want people, people are going to aim for this door. You want that core point there to operate and not be hard to interpret. Other core points that people may pass, if they're going to a funnel position of an escape door, that last core point must be confusing. Yeah. Well, um, guys, what are you coding it? I've, I'm, I've put it as a, a, a C2, to be honest with you. Um, what do you think, Dave? I, well, it's initially C2, but the more, I mean, looking at the layout of the building and how it's used and the likelihood that this would be used and the potential confusion, I may push it to a C1 if it's going to compromise to see actual effectiveness of the system. Yeah, I'm assuming that would still it's, work if I pushed it, by the way. Yeah, but, who's, yeah, but does everyone know to push it if no. they can't see that? That's the but question. So, so we should have spares on site. <laughs> So, or, you, or you see the bit of sellotape kind of holding the, <laughs> the glass together, or a lollipop I've stick I've seen before. I've seen, I've seen cocktail sticks. Cocktail sticks, yeah. You know, on the back, people have put. So, um, I mean, in theory, if you're maintaining this, um, you should have spare spares on site anyway. So, you, you know, you should be able to replace it. Um, but, you know, testing that, it's going to work, but you... The problem is you can't leave a system in fire. You can't walk away, and there's massive risk of this that it's going to um, it's going to cause a false alarm or unwanted alarm because um, and that causes a lot of complacency. The more we have fire alarms going off when they're not supposed to, it causes complacency. It causes people to think they're a nuisance, and then they misuse them. Mm -hmm. So you know, we well, see things being turned off. Um, so forth. Even if you're going to the wholesalers to get a replacement, there's a valid comment from Dean. If you if you work with fire alarms, you'd have done this while going to wholesalers to get a new one. I would argue, if I was a judge, and say, well, if you work with fire alarms, one, why don't you keep a stock on the van? Um, and two, if you did go to the wholesalers to get a new one, fair enough, because it may be a special. Something you need, have you told the responsible person for the building what, what, what the risks are? Have you have you done that before you've left the building? It, it doesn't matter if the wholesaler is five minutes away or two hours away. Um, but it's a valid point, um, uh, Dean, to be honest with you. I, I probably wouldn't do that, um, and I wouldn't condone that. I would make sure there were plenty of spares. Um, for those who, again, who are coding this, I mean, I think, uh, Dan, what was your code? Was it C1? C2? If I was maintaining this, I'd have a spare. So I'd. Okay, I'd... give me a code. Come on, this is a coding game. So I would actually code this. I would change the spare, yeah. and then I would code it a. Um, C3 for not having a plastic cover. Okay. John, based on the yeah, photo? I was going to go for C2. So. Good man. Yeah. Well, 5839, 45.4, the switch mechanism of every manual coin point should be tested, either by removal of the frangible, our new favourite word, insertion of a test key operation device as it would be operating the fire. 20.2, all manual coin points should be fitted with a protective cover, which is movable to gain access to the frangible element. And then 35.22a, this part of 5839 recommends manual core points should be fitted with protective covers. While the recommendation is not retrospective in existing systems, um, which there is a frequent unwanted operation of manual core points, protective covers should be fitted. I I'm starting to like 5839 more than I like 7671. I find that I find these smaller standards are written by a fewer pool of people and they make a lot more sense. Yes. Yes, just remove the Teflon y bits, um, as we yeah. talked about earlier on. Right, moving on. So, next one. And this, I think, was sent in by our good friend from the Welsh Valleys. Um, so, yeah. Uh, do you know what jumps to mind straight away? That's under a floor. Look at the state yeah. of all that rubble and crap. 
No one got any pride anymore. Clean it up, man. I think, disgusting. I think Jono said that this is an extension, an alteration for a sounder, I believe. Um, so okay. they've altered a, t- a sounder circuit by... Do a bit of twin and earth. A bit of twin and earth. And a twin earth linking connectors. that. Yeah. yeah. Wow, and that's the, just pants. And going to the left, the FP, is, is, that, is that squashed? Is that notched or underneath the beam or what? It's not going through it. Um... I don't know. It looks like it's going under, doesn't it? Under the beam, and yeah, so that's interesting. Okay, so mainly, yeah, we've got a different cable type here, haven't we? I said it was done on the original install. It's under the beam. Under the beam. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> um, I don't know if everyone can see that, but that spells lash in, in many languages, including Welsh, Scottish, and English, and Irish. It's just dog crap. Um, I Yeah, I, let's just run the poll. Let's run the poll. We've seen enough. Yeah, Jonathan's put the sounder is another two feet away from this. So, uh, yeah, it was just an extension to the existing thing. And they've done it for some reason in that. Uh, I am there. going to. I'm stuck between. Can we do a C1.5? <laughs> is there such a code? Is um, the space below um, habited, fire risk? For the ceiling above, but like, do we know, Jono? Is there a risk? What, what are you thinking there, Dave? Well, just in case there is fire, and then the, the ceiling, and then the wiring system here is subject to the fire conditions, likely. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, 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 what you're saying is, is that if this was an enclosed floor, essentially you've got some form of fire barrier. For the well, ceiling. if it's, it depends on obviously the barriers. Yeah, but obviously, if this is under the floor, then depending on the fire risk, yeah, as to where it goes. I mean, obviously, fire propagates on the ground as well. And we don't know if there's any down lights, you know, that could cause fire within the void itself. Yeah, it's, yeah. so any I, other risks like, in the void and things like I'm that. I'm not a big fan of seeing. And again, I'll say it again: it's my OCD, but I don't like seeing rubble and dirt and dust and wood shavings and stuff left under floors. Well, the, the problem is, is they've pushed it down a hole. What you need is another hole to push yeah. that down. So, you know, down to the, the room below. But yeah, what I'm, at, what I'm at is I'm at C2 and I'm trying to determine if there's any other measures or so considerations to go up to C1. Okay, so yeah. Dave, if, if there was a fire in this room, bear in mind, this, this might be a circuit for a sounder that could be doing a large proportion of the building. There, it could be a sleeping risk. This could be an HMO, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a flaming inferno in this room. Yes. Do you think within the void it's going to heat up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and we've got Jonathan is an HMO, so that's that's exactly what it is. It's six bedroom, six bedroom HMO. HMO. C one then. Watch. What's the C one then? Yeah, I'm I'm pushing towards the C one as well. Right. Well, I'm ending the poll now, and I'll share the results. That's enough. And share the results. And sixty nine percent have stated it's a C one, and thirty one percent have said it's a C two. No C threes, FIs, or anything else. So I think that's pretty conducive there. Um, good coding, good observations from everybody there, I think. And what have we got? It just, here? It, it just shows the importance of understanding right. the fire behavior and how fire impacts this system. Yeah, definitely. You know, we need to apply that here, not just because electricians think of risk of mechanical impact, damage, integrity, connections. We don't always think about the fire because obviously we. We rely on 5839 for that. But here we need to consider that. And that cable would, yeah, wouldn't last long at all if the fire was at this point. So this is where it it chips into a really important part of 5839, like 56010. Um, And this is is the the never-ending loop back. 37.2a, the entire system should conform to requirements 7671. So in theory, uh, 52110202, which is premature collapse, you, you could reference that in a 5839 report if you wanted to add more robustness if you were doing a 5839 inspection and maintenance report there's nothing stopping you cross-referencing if you've got a working knowledge of 7671 to make the report more robust there are recommendations to this standard supplement but do not conflict with these requirements whereas any such conflict is considered to exist the recommendations of this standard should take precedence why because it's a fire safety standard Mm -hmm. Um, 26.2c with appropriate methods of jointing support and jointing should generally be used now i'm not a fan of the word generally because generally to somebody could be plastic connect blocks or porcelain or whatever. Yeah. That, that twin and earth is not a fire um, survival cable in any way, shape or form. No. And neither are those plastic connect blocks. No. 
So for me, it's compromised and it's most certainly C1 every day of the week. But you can hopefully see now we're doing this. There's an absolute synergy and interconnection between the two standards. So when, if you say to someone, oh, the fire alarm, I want to code it like this. And someone goes, oh, don't be stupid. Hmm. No, you're not. Again, being adding to this, this is likely to be an electrician doing. So, let's say in the future, an electrician may find this yep. when doing work. Yeah. A fire engineer on a maintainer doing maintenance won't discover this in routine testing, will they? Mm -hmm. Right. You, you, how, yeah, how could they? they right. It's very likely that they wouldn't. Right. So fundamentally, the, the electrician needs to have that extra method, extra understanding of who else is going to raise this concern. If the fire maintainer is not going to discover it with regular testing, then I have to right now. And I have mm -hmm. to understand how to address that. And also, that's the purpose of the red cable. So we know that it's a, a life safety system. Mm. So, you know, even someone with little knowledge can look at that and go, that's a problem like the way it's been jointed is a problem. Mm. And the other thing here also is that I very much doubt these systems are in, tested by manufacturers again using twin nerve cabling. Mm. In the 5839 inspection, we're probably earlier, I'm sorry if we, if we come into this, is there a box that we tick to confirm this kind of thing or to code this thing if we see it? Um, y yes, there is, yeah. Because it okay. it's just like a, well, hang on, Dave, let me think. No, it's more, it's more, this is more comes under section two design considerations, which okay. will, which lists out, um, which cable to use. All right. That's cool. Because obviously, you know, my software that I'm developing, I'm thinking that I need, I'm going to add some kind of handshake between seven, six, seven, one, five, eight, three, nine, five, two, six, six. So when you see this on your seven, six, seven, one AICR, you can add a coma to five, six, oh, but then you can right. go to the inspection requirements of five, eight, three, nine. And just then I'll, sh I'll share you my, um, yeah. my inspection schedule. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, moving on, chaps. Um, forgive the noise. There's a helicopter above my house um, for some weird reason. There's a football match on tonight. What can you do? Um, right, next one. Um, lash up. Just words mm. fail me how bad that is. And whoever did that just wants. So they look like MICC cabling. They mm -hmm. do. Into the back of what looks like a uh, yeah back entry conduit box. Yeah. With a dome lid. <clears throat> um, and rather than screwing a, a, a hook uh, for a jack chain, they've just screwed a, an FP200 gland. And no doubt there's a connector in there. Or maybe some twisted ends and tape. Yeah. But again, the hole. <clears throat> yeah. Again, uh, I'm immediately, you know, this this happens a lot where engineers don't want to play with MI or touch MI. And they'd rather just try to put it over there out the way. You know, yeah. <laughs> this does happen a lot. Um, but think about what we said earlier on, you know, in the fire condition, when the structure of the building is going to start changing, the ceiling may go down, the ceiling may have some structure, or other people working below moving this. This and is at I, risk. This is at risk here, this, this is an old system, and they're upgrading by adding an extra detector. And what they've done is they've taken an FP4 um, core mm. off the, um, the, the two two cores, which, um, again, could be a problem depending on how they've extended it. Because if you, um, you know, that, that four core, if it's damaged, if something goes all the way through that four core. Do you lose integrity? Out, yeah, it could take out, that might be a complete, I don't know, section mm. of a loop. Like it could be a whole annex of a building. Mm. So is, there, is it better to have your loop in separate conductors, not in one multi-core cable Too where simple. it could lose its integrity in one slice? Yeah. That makes sense. It, it, it kind of depends though how it's, yeah what's on the other end but yeah you know for in in some circumstances we've installed in heritage buildings we have used a four core for a small loop with fp of micc but it's been noted in a drawing it's been agreed with the client and it's had a, it's been risk assessed by a consultant by a design the designer and everything else i think if, if you don't mind me chipping in here chaps i think going forward eventually there's going to be uh, um, not a divide but a split in contractors there's going to be contractors that go above and beyond work from the regs and there's going to be contractors that just do the ba basic hand-drawn minimum seven six seven one five eight three nine five two six six certificates there's so much more in these regulations when you work from the intent of them and this is why inspection schedules recording schedules should include far more we've said before in dave's webinars where he talks about you know r1 rn values to understand short circuit uh, current values of uh, of installations there's a lot more we need we should be doing understanding earth leakage from an installation uh, i'm i'm slightly disheartened that the industry is is years behind 
the mindset and and this is just applied engineering logic this is us understanding the regulations and the engineering solutions to understand the intent of the regulations and ensure that we walk away and we've given someone something safe and fit and we're proud of mm-hmm. more importantly as a client i don't want my contractors giving me a 7671 certificate and going there you go it meets the regs i want the contractor going there you go this is this is it doesn't just meet the regs it actually is worked from the regs and here's all the extra information we give because we want to do a proper service I think um, 5839 part one is quite robust, to be honest. It's quite, everything that's in there is um, how a system needs to be installed. And the only time you're going to change that quite often is a variation because you literally cannot put a detector, for example, in a small room with um, an air conditioning unit, Um, you know, because it's going to blow the smoke away, you know, and, and the hot air. Um, you know, so it, it, it needs a lot of design consideration, but it's quite a robust document. Mm. Okay, so as far as poll results go, there we go. 48% C1, 48% dead, dead heat, yeah. 48% C2, and then 4% um, C3. I'm going to go C1 on that. To honest with you, that's my professional view is C1 um, and re-educate the person who did it. Um, and the contractor, because if a contractor is signing that off, then I would have serious words with a contractor. Um, guys, what's your codes quickly before we move on to the next slide? Again, I mean, I, I've said C1 on a number of occasions where the fire incident would result in failure. And as Dan has added with the potential integrity issue of two of four cores, I can't, I can't leave C1. I'd have to stay on C1. Dan, code? C1. John? Yeah, be a C1. So. There we go. I think that's that's it, right? So let's not share those results anymore. Let's see what 5039 says. And again, 26.2, appropriate methods of support and jointing should generally be used. I hate the term general. Yeah. Um, there's more though. There's 26.2G, cables should be installed without external joints, wherever practicable. All terminations of our accessories should, uh, should be as to minimize probability of early failure in the event of fire. I think that's going to fail pretty quick, given the fact that would will probably fail. Um, other than in the case of joints or within system components, such as control equipment, manual call points, fire detectors, sounders, terminals used to joint cables should be constructed materials that would stand a similar temperature. On London Underground, you, you cannot do a joint unless it's in a steel conduit, metal box, or porcelain connectors, the whole lot. It's all fixed base, and that the, the joint doesn't impede the integrity of the system, period. And it's labelled fire alarm just in line with the intent of the standard. And then 37 in 5839, the nature and quality of the installation work needs to be such as to maintain the integrity of the fire detection alarm system to minimise the duration and extent of disablement of the system during maintenance and modification. Installation practices need to conform with 7671. So once again, we're referring back to the mothership. Um, yeah. And we're also talking about nature and quality of the work. So there you go. There's, there's some of your counter arguments. Right, moving on. What is this? Jesus. Okay, it's... Well, they're using ceramics. It's... it's <laughs> it, um, um, yeah. Why have we only got C3 and F5 showing on here, Paul? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It's some, don't ask me why, but... Uh, so C1 and C2s are available. It's a, oh, it's a glitch with the system. Sorry. Okay, yeah, so, so C1 and C2 are available. Sorry. It's like on that left... Well, on both of them, you, it looks like some um, alarm cable that's running through that as well. So oh, yeah. we've got alarm cable running fire alarm cables. Wow, oh, that's bad. That's that's a that's a lot packed into an MT2 there. That's a lot. I just say we won't normally put other things in MT2, didn't I? Jesus Christ! You did just say that, I Dave. Did just sorry. Say that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Bit that. Yeah, take there that are, back. There are very right. special people out there. Apparently, let's everybody code that. I think this will be a quick one. Um, yeah. I, I will be devastated if I see a C3 or an FI. That's why we left it on the screen. <laughs> Don't pick those codes. Mm. Not that I'm trying to tell you your engineering judgment, but that's if it looks if it looks bad and it smells bad, it generally is bad. Is this, is, is this evidence of an engineer engineer just trying to hash it to get it to work again or to get it to work? Is that the objective for them? Well, if they wanted it to work, uh, would you genuinely pack it all in a bit of MT2? Would you not get a junction well, box? If, if all they're trying to do is on the day, get it to actually make the noise when they set the button to then silence it. it, it that to me looks like the, the cable, the cable, the white cable was there and they've cut it and jointed it. to. Well, run. it's come through the wall. Yeah. No, I, through... re- I reckon the red is new. It's come through the wall, and they're obviously they're either refeeding it or they're coming off of it in this trunking. Yeah. 
<clears throat> and they're using, you know, uh, plastic covering for fire rated cabling. Um, <laughs> ironically, with um, yeah, ceramic connector blocks. So they they've got it half right. Well, the ten points for the ceramic, not. <laughs> and also, the, you know. The, if you were to test those cables, look at the bends on them as well, how they've been, you know, forced around. Yeah, the bending radius well, of these cables is horrific. Do you want to show you? Um, like, yeah, uh, section 522 of a mechanical stresses. Yeah, it's just rubbish. It's, yeah, you can pretty much throw all of chapter five at them, to be honest with you, on this. It's just, it's poor workmanship materials, period. Um, but I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results and you're going to be stunned by the results. No, you're not. 84% have said it's a C1. Completely agree, and sixteen uh, percent have said it's a C two potential danger. Do you know what? Because it's so bad, I could only ever endorse a C one. It's just a bodge. It's a very bad bodge. And if that was your building, your head office, you would you would be shot if you were the responsible engineer and you found that on your installs and said, "Yeah, it's only potentially dangerous." You'd say, "No, that needs to be that needs to be dealt with." Let's get an engineer out and let's get that properly addressed and wired correctly, and it could easily be done. Do you want to show you? So it wouldn't be too hard to do a proper joint on that, and, but what do I know? Yeah, just a quick, quick question. So, I mean, I've just kind of run through in my mind occasions where this may be something that is like temporary. Is is there a strategy for temporary systems with fire, or is it just the no. full five to five eight three nine? There's, no, there's, there's no, no such thing as a temporary system. There's no temporary. Yeah, system Dave, I don't like the word temporary either. Temporary infers you it's a lot more less attention and lackluster approach to it. Um, it's it go to me temporary is the same I mean, as that'll do. I'm on about the event industry. Oh, right. where I well, see these falling yeah, short a lot of the temporary time. Temporary duration. Okay. In, in these events, I often just see extinguishers being used, and that's it. Unless there's a marquee that's up for a long period of time. Uh, if if that's your control measure, if you've done a if you've done a fire strategy and your fire strategies, you will have fire wardens with walking with fire extinguishers and enhanced. Mm. alarm systems and all sorts whether they're just bells that people can ring then maybe but i'd i'd be interested to see the person who'd accept that <laughs> but dave if we if we think about this if there was a fault on a cable for example and you had to make it let's say let's say this was a temporary join just to get something working overnight and yeah. this was an engineer called in the middle of the night um it's fair to say that yeah he might not have the materials and everything required to get it up and running mm -hmm. so what the process is is that you're supposed to revert back to the responsible person who's, you know, responsible for the fire safety of the premises. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking if there was a fire here, what's the scenario? Because um, if somebody was to die um, due to a fire, bear in mind, there's going to be a fire investigation. What was the cause of the death? So it, it's, it, they work their way back, you know, and it's like, has this been installed right? If this was documented that this happened, you know, this temporary join was made last night, obviously the person who done this, they, they would be quizzed and say, why did you do, do this like this? And have you taken all reasonable steps to make sure that you're getting it up and running? Because of course, maintenance is required, things happen. Um, so, you know, I think um, as a temporary repair, it, it, it goes back to the responsible person. What are they doing to make sure that we're getting the system up and running as quick yeah. as possible? I mean, so just just going through this, this is obviously glaringly a five, six, ten, ten point. But five, eight, three, nine's got three clauses straight away. Twenty six point two appropriate method support jointing. Twenty six point two, as we've just said about the uh, terminations. Uh, you know, doing a proper joint labelled up fire alarm. Thirty seven, the nature and quality installation work. But just on the wiring rigs alone, you could quote them one three one one requirements of protection of persons and property against dangers and damage, <clears throat> which may arise in reasonable use. I'm thinking good workmanship materials, 13411. Um, I'm thinking uh, 5210, 202, premature collapse. So there's straight away six regulations that can be referenced back to why that is so important. Never mind the duty of care road to maintain a, a working fire alarm system and the insurer's requirements and everything else. It's, it's a no-brainer. This is just a bodge, a lash. Um, and sadly, I'm going to say it was done by somebody who evidently isn't qualified nor competent in the application of 5839 Part 1. Yeah, the, the problem with things like that is if someone does that, there's a danger that, oh, now the system works, so we'll just forget about it and leave it like that. Yeah. And it's the same with the electrical stuff. If it's all lashed together, oh, the lights work now, the sockets work, and it will just get left like this for 10 years. And that's 
obviously not acceptable. So yeah, um, yeah, John, I can't I can't disagree with you. The fact that somebody put that in trunking and probably put the lid on it, yeah, um, evidently was just go away. Um, Will Lloyd's made a comment: fire detection, fire alarm systems are generally <laughs> stop it um, used for the protection of life. Would you want something that temporary? I've got I've got a wireless fire detection system sitting in one of my offices. Dan, you yeah. know that. My Bring question was mainly aimed, my question was mainly aimed at the event industry where you'll have events that are like in the summer festivals you'll have events and marquees that are up for three or four months at a time. Do they have a fire strategy though? They, this, they this have summer. they have some will have a sprinkler system, some will okay. have extra extinguishers. Sometimes yeah. we see the fire risk being we're outdoors allow the cables to catch fire. Yeah. Um, yeah. you'll very rarely see an FB integrated fire alarm system with zonal use in many of these structures and that's kind of why i raised it yeah they, they they use many other methods to control fire risk than this yeah i mean one of the ultimate principles of fire protection is is to just make use non-flammable everything you know well, um, mark, you mark, long, yeah long the problem with mark, everything you couldn't set fire to it if you tried now yeah. so the problem, you, problem you have with marquees is everything has to look clean so what they'll then do is they'll put yes. the steel structure in they'll put the canopies in then they'll throw sheets of material to yes. make it all Fancy canvas and then you'll throw carpet in and then you'll store the carpet in the corner and then you'll bring cooking appliances in and then you'll bring then you'll be using hot works then their, their risk assessment will be put a co2 extinguisher and a foam extinguisher in the corner which they'll then block off it's, a, it's an area I, i'm bouncing backwards and forwards with fire risk assessors I in have, the event yeah. industry sounds like a headache Dave. well a i've seen headache, mate. i've been to alex and i've seen events there where they've had um, manual call points, which have again got conduits going up high level onto a steel frame, and then they've got a wireless transmitter yeah. going off, and it's part of a wireless system because when they've mapped it out, they've realised actually the 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 distance to travel to the escape routes they've needed yeah. additional measures. But that's good fire engineering practice. If if you're doing a, a weekend market, then it's potentially a disaster waiting to happen, especially if someone's got a load of gas bottles and it's at the point of access and egress, and nobody's thought about this. Yeah, this temporary thing, I mean, there's obviously a big difference between an installation that's going to be there, say, for a few weeks or a month or three, and just a dangerous lash-up, because just because something's there, say, for six weeks, it needs, still needs to be done properly. Mm -hmm. But obviously this is temporary, and it's a dreadful lash-up, so there's a big difference between a temporary uh, yeah. installation and something that's just been bodged in by... Yeah. Now, that previous picture, to me, just looks like an idiot that just tried to make the thing work or tried yeah, to get it working. Yeah, it's an work. That was the outcome there. I reckon it was probably um, a permanent day. <laughs> yeah, no, there's probably a permanent cock-up. I don't think it was temporary. Okay, gang, next one. All right, so what we got here is brick dust. Um, well, it looks like it's been very well loved. Um, and also I think there's a hole at the top where the original cable may have came in. And it looks, those uh, cores look like they're damaged there. So we've They got... do, yeah. Yeah, you can see there's a slice across one of the um, line yeah. conductors. Yeah, someone presumably just slashed in with a knife rather Oh, than... it's okay though, because well, it yeah. looks like somebody's twisted the CPCs together of the FP200. Right. But it's all right, they've covered it with a bit of three mil sleeving. <sighs> Thank God. I thought there was something wrong with it. <laughs> the other thing I'm thinking oh dear. is... Um, Obviously, that's a switch, and we've got brick dust all over it. How does that affect its functionality? Contacts. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Could could that could that settle on the contacts and cause um, spurious alarms? And could it also contact uh, cause high impedance joints? Could it cause it? Yeah. This. It's just was, rubbish. I think was this picture taken enough. by the installer to say, right, I now need to clean this, or was this left like this? I'm pretty sure and this was discovered was... later. Sent to us by somebody who found this on an inspection. That's um, insane. Uh, hang on, that trunking looks the, the same light. as what we've just seen. It, it could be the same, yeah. <laughs> you know what? Actually, no, no, because that trunking, that's probably a bit of MT3 by the looks of it. That's a, you know, it's probably a 2x2 or 3x3 next to it because you can see purple, so there's telecoms in there because um, that's normally telecoms multi pair. So it's obviously a commercial build where somebody has just chucked all the cabling in. So you've got telecoms, fire alarms, all sorts in there. And that grey could be meter tails. It could be all sorts. Who knows? Either way, it's a lashes paradise. Again, this is, this is to me, is more evidence of unskilled workers where they've pulled the cable through. You can see where they've smashed the side of the box out. Um, it's damaged the cores. It's just unskilled, unqualified, incompetent work. And the trouble is it does hardworking, honest electricians out of a decent day rate. Mm -hmm. Does... um. 
Dan, does like organizations like Bay for similar kind of try to engineer this out or look for this kind of this kind of behavior? <clears throat> BAFE is a scheme. Mm. I hate that word. Mm. So they will say, "Are you inspecting to five eight three nine part one?" And they won't ask you to prove evidence of that or to. Yeah, they they do they do. So um, obviously they're checking that you document what you're finding and, and okay. what have you. So if I found this installation, I found the in, the engineer's name and address on the system. Could I then report that to BAFE or someone if they were accredited with them? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Okay. Well, because, because the, th the thing is, BAFE is a scheme, and you uh, then you're assessed by a third party company to ensure that you're working to the scheme. Oh, we've heard that before. Okay, yeah. But you like BAFE, don't you? I like the scheme because I think right. it's if you work to it, it can help your business processes very well. Okay. Yeah, I don't know enough to make an informed I, judgment. I don't. Um, all I know is that someone, something in the industry has to protect the clients from this kind of nonsense. Yes. Um, although, in fairness, that's common sense. But Will Lloyd <laughs> has made a very interesting point. Hello, Will. If anybody doesn't know who he is, he did a podcast of us on fire. So listen to our fire stuff. There's some interesting fact-finding stuff in there. Um, he's put interesting question about the sleeving um, being that colour as it's not a CPC. Yeah. What is it then? Yeah. It's a screen. Oh, it's a screen. So it's part so screening is part of the earthing though, isn't it? It's it's or is it a functional earth? Is it screening for functional earthing? So it provides a uh, you have to connect it down to the well, panel. This is so where we'd ask this is where we'd ask our resident and... expert. What would Dan do? Yeah, what would Dan do? Dan, what would you do? Would you colour it cream or green and yellow? Not putting you on the spot, but it's pretty standard people use green and yellow. That's what they yeah. that's what people use. But if that's if okay, so I'm I'm going to go into this because this is an interesting point because if if that screening is there to help the panel detect earth faults and it's a part of the function of the panel, could you determine that as functional earth it on the circuit? Again, yeah. I'm not it, it, I'm asking an incompetent question. I would say yeah, it's a, it's a functional earth, yeah, because um, it's yeah, it's not. So a under seven six seven one, you could you could color that. Cream, cream is that still cream, the colour? Is it going pink? pink. Yeah. Oh, pink. God. Well, well, we ain't got pink sleeving, so just chuck a load of red pink. outside for six months until it fades. Just throw, just throw some white in the wash. Oh. <laughs> okay, so there's an interesting debate uh, straight away. So thanks for that question. Um, well, that's actually a very good point. Would you code that if it was cream or pink? Sorry, sorry, I, I'm still got cream in my head from. I mean, oh, it's cream for so long, hasn't it? And now they've decided to change it to yeah. pink for reasons. Is there. it pink now or is it coming it's, up to be it's pink? It's cream slash pink and the amendment to draft is oh, pink. God. Yeah. So, so there you go. There's a note for people. It's cream slash right. pink in the current corrigendum. So let's corrigendum. share the results. So, and, and I'm going to agree with this. Um, C1, um, yeah, C2, 43%. C1's 50%. So half of people said it was. And 7% C3. Um, John, let's start with you. What's your code? What do you think? Yeah, I guess C1 because you've got no idea that that's even going to work. I mean, it's full of dust and the cables are damaged and it's, yeah, I mean, it's just broken beyond. Dan, the pedantic engineer, what's your code? I'd C1 because we've got multiple things here. We uh, haven't, we? We've got damaged cores. Yeah. Um, we've got, we don't know if that's working, if it's, it's functional. Um, and obviously the way it's been installed, it hasn't been installed to good workmanship. <laughs> Oh, no, has added a link to some pink sleeving. Hasn't got any pink sleeving. You are joking. He, is, he, he, he knows everything. He's got some three mil PVC sleeving wall. I don't pink. want. I don't want pink. I want two mil. I don't want three mil. Two mil. In the comments, Jono's just shared some pink sleeving links. Yeah. I would I'll also go on YouTube. I would have to go see one on on peer peer. Pure opinion, because uh, somebody mentioned further up the chat, they had this exact situation and it had affected the contact <laughs> making the switch inoperable. <laughs> yeah. Oh dear. That's going on your Instagram later, isn't it, Paul? Uh, no, it's not. It's it not is. pink sleeving. No, no, no. It's not LSOH anyway, according to the comments. So, um, See, what, what has Will started now? He's done that on purpose, hasn't he? You it? have deliberately started something, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> Right, so just going on again, magic number here, 5610 in 7671, if you just want one regulation. So don't let people say the fire and 7671, there isn't synergy. But in 5839, 37.28, the entire system should conform to requirements 7671. That 
it's pretty crap to be perfectly frank um just just alone in the trunking next to it the dust the ip rating uh the protection of the cores the damage to the cores potential sleeving of functional earthing um 37.2 f arrangements for earthing should be in accordance with the recommendation of the manufacturer so what does the fire alarm panel recommend manufacturer because somebody said it's it's common for green and yellow i'm not i'm not disagreeing whether it's no. green and yellow or cream i'm i'm not, actually not that fast um maybe you could get a cream and green and yellow or put an extra stripe in the green and yellow so it's a, an earthing screening functional conductor there you oh go Jono. God. get get that made sell it in two mil you'll make a fortune um care should be taken to ensure electrical continuity and electromagnetic screens including metallic sheaths and then 45.4 the switch mechanism of every manual component should be tested including that favorite frangible word of dave's insertion of a key switch this is this is pants as a system if you came to this i would i would be mortified the minute i took the screws off take a photo and put it back and just probably want to run away so yeah i i agree i think it's um it's uh, yeah i mean my opinion is the installer hasn't finished when i see that yeah, but he's been doing it for 10 years by the level of yeah. dust that's on there. <laughs> you know, like he's been doing it for years. The job's just not finished and the no. tight needs to get him back. <laughs> so do you agree with that then, Dave? C1 for you? C1, yeah. Um, I, I anticipate it could make it not work. Uh, and, and somebody up in the chat said they had that and it didn't work. And so I can't, I can't move away from that. Okay. Pink thing. It's already pink now. It came in on the 8th of September. Thanks for that, John. You've really upset me. Thanks. But now it is pink, so cream it's has gone. Pink. No more cream. Oh, but isn't great. it still pink as an LV control circuit as well, John? I believe it is. Yeah. yeah. So go Just to add to the confusion. Yeah, go, go for it. Pink and pink. <laughs> we want yep. pink fire alarms now. That. Yeah, that we'll fantastic on pink. my railway. So, uh, yeah. Right, next one. There you go. What the hell is this all about? This, this just looks like a complete and utter lash up, really. This looks like somewhere that's been modified again and again and again. There's some class two, good old fashioned class two lighting, bit of tray to, to the left, obviously not being used for anything fire alarm anyway. And then you've just got the cable. I think them cables have been moved and unscrewed maybe to take that light fit in by the looks of it. Yeah. Um, okay. They've just been left pole. hanging like this. Yeah. Why not? So swing it. There's a section in 5039 that says thou shall swing off of fire alarm swing. cables. No, hang on. Sorry, that was I was a dream. Damn, sorry. Um, let's go for the coding. Everybody jump on. Code it. What do you think? Um, straight away, the screw ends. I'm assuming that somebody could possibly reach up and grab that maybe. Worst case scenario, jump up and grab it. I'm just going to throw something into the mix. Go on, Dan. So um, you've obviously got two cables coming in. You've got one cable coming out. They, they all look like two core cables. So... This to me either looks like it's been spurred off um, a radial or a loop which isn't allowed, or it's a remote indicator. So a remote indicator often is installed when you've got a detector in a void, and because you can't see the red LED to see that it's in fire or, or which detector it is, you have a remote indicator where you can see it. So um, if, if you've got an addressable system, you don't necessarily need to have remote indicators because the panel will tell you it's up in the void. But on a non-addressable system, um, you won't know. It will just say zone one, zone two, zone three, or whatever. So, so if this was used for remote indicating, that's very important for its integrity for the operators to know there's a yes. fire condition in there? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any more votes, please? We've only got 24 of you. So keep voting. Just go with your gut. Um, and Andrew's asking if this is a void detector. I mean, I don't know where this photo come from. So um, no, I think this is one of the ones where you were sent in. I think it was. It was. I think that was removed or some something had been modified, and that was how they found the system left. Um, for me, I'm going. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna jump in there. I'm gonna say it's a C2. Um, I don't. I think the system. It looks like it's all. I'm not going to say constructed well, but terminations, position of detectors, etc., could be better. A bit more distance from the light, but. I just see a loose cable hanging, so that's all. I'm only going on what I see on the photo. So I'm going to close this poll. So if you haven't voted, there you go. And I'm going to share the results. And it is 58% with C2, 39% C1, and 3% C3. So that's, um, yeah. Uh, John, what's your code, mate? B2, I'd go for that one. Good man. Dan, the pedantic engineer. I want to see more. I want to see. Yeah, this is what I called you. Sandy, did you? 
I want to stand back and look, look more at the picture to see what's going on and what that cable actually is. So, um, F I C two. I'm actually going to F I it. <gasps> okay, F I breathe, uh, David. F I need more. Yep. Um, C two. Yeah. Uh, in its current state, but pending F I, and if it is. Uh, as you know, a, you know, a cable as Dan said for identifying it, then the system may fail. And if a fire occurs in that room and that cable could fail, then it'd be a C1. Okay, so again, just on this, we've got 5610, our favorite number from 7671 in this context. But 5839 for this one, we thought we'd give you a little bit of it rather than not being able to afford the standard 26.2. Cable systems used for all parts of the critical signal paths and for the low voltage main supply to the system should adequately resist the effects of fire. For most fire detection and fire alarm systems, standard fire resisting should be considered to provide sufficient resistance to the effects of fire with appropriate methods of support and jointing. That's not really effective support and jointing. And again, you can quote 5211202, premature collapse regulation if you wanted, good workmanship and materials regulation from both standards. There's lots you can put there. Now, we could have... We were, we were um and an R and down, weren't we, as to whether we fill this screen with just text extracts from the standards, but we thought, no, it would be just a snapshot. Mm. So, um, yeah. Can I, just, okay. can I just add a comment at this point? Certainly. This is a good example of us needing to know more. Even Dan needs to know more. Yes. If we rely heavily on taking a picture and going on a Facebook or reading a code breaker to exercise our opinions, we're going to get into trouble. Yeah. We can use them to help us, but we must make sure we can collect as much information to understand at the point when we are the ones on site doing the proper risk. Yes. You know, so just to say, I mean, I've come up with three different codes here because I need to know more. Dan's done the same. And we would easily go to a code breaker or we'd go and share it with people, but we need to collect as much info as we can for us yes. all to be able to get our engineering judgment across. And an image can be seen in many different ways if we don't have the competence to interpret what we see. Now, Dan's offered information to me that I didn't understand, and that's changed my C2 to a potential C1. So context and understanding of risk is, is really important. Regardless of what some people will say, uh, it is very important for electricians to develop that understanding. Some electricians won't need it. Some are mm. quite happy to just go along and do their installs day to day, but this is for the inspectors. These are the people that are helping de-risking businesses, providing competent advice to organizations, entities, uh, ultimately insurers, stuff that could ever be used in a court of law, read out by barristers, et cetera, peer reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is really quite important stuff. Right, next one. And my C1 and C2 have disappeared again. There we go, back up. Next one, we've got two, oh, it's old school and new school, by the looks of it. Yeah. Right, I'm going to relaunch the poll on this one. Uh, relaunch the poll. So, what I mean, what it looks like here, we've either got um, they're upgrading the system um, and they haven't taken out the old equipment. Mm -hmm. um, is, this the, is the assumption here that this system on the left is not a long, no longer in service? I mean, it's a great I'd question. So, yeah, looking at the age of it, I think they're different systems. So, yeah. Mm. But it's a great question. I've got to be careful how many times I say assume because Mr. But Wall having said that, Dave, I've seen before where you've had a shared entrance and you've had maybe um, a floor one side to one tenant, um, yeah. like yeah, commercial, and then the other, and they because they're not liaising with each other, which is part of the regulatory reform order, which they should do with their fire safety. They've installed two separate systems. Mm. So when you're running out here to operate, which one do you press? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I look at that and I, I immediately go, new system put in for the new Part M accessible heights for uh, accessible persons, vulnerable persons, etc. It, it's a hybrid of new and old, but I still see plastic trunking, which I'm not a fan of. Personally, you know me, Dan, I prefer conduit systems every time, especially if it's a commercial application. Um, yeah, and the old one, I'm assuming the old one needs to be ripped out. If the two are running consecutively, I would suggest that somebody is being really cheap on their costs for as far as fire alarm budgets go. So for me, I'm going to put my neck on the line and say straight away, that's an FI. Um, I could work from FI to C3 to C2 easily on any one of them without understanding more, but there is definitely a code there. Now I'm going to end this poll. So please, if you've got 10 more seconds to code, to code it, 
if you haven't already coded, um, 71% of you have. So click a button, take a guess, mm. go with your gut. And I'm going to give it a little bit more and we'll end this poll uh, now. And we will share the results. And the results are in. And the results are very simply 23% have said C1, 27% C2, uh, C3, 17%, and FI33, which wins the day. So everybody's inquisitive by this picture. There's mm. Our brains are sitting specs going, I want to know more. I need to understand. I need to go away and ask people, is this system live? Is that working? How does this function? Uh, you know, so that you can put a better report. So I'm actually quite pleased that FI is standing out here. Yeah. Um, to be honest with you. Because yeah, I think a lot of unknowns here that you, I mean, is it still in use? Is it just some old thing someone left there and it's mm. all uh, definitely. A I like, I like the fact that people are asking the questions from the pictures um, and, and they're going for FI. That's, that's a good mindset. Um, okay. Well, what do we think of a code? I'm going FI. What do you think, John? Yeah, I'll go for FI as well. So. Dan? FI. Dave? Yeah. Okay, so we're all agreed with FIs. I think there's some um, good assessments there. And let's see if we can get, oh, that's disappeared. Uh, 560, 10, 5839, 20.2. The method of operation of all MCPs in a system should be that of type A as specified in BSEN 5411. All call points should be identical unless there is a specific reason for differentiation. Oh, now you've really uh -huh. got me. Okay. So, Dan, you mentioned the fire safety reform order requires obviously the, the the situation to occur where you can't be in a position where one system is one and one is the other. They have not, to they have to link. Not necessarily, Dave, but what, what should happen is um, part of the RRO is that um, people who are in control of a premises need to liaise with each other and coordinate. Mm -hmm. So... So you're coordinating with each other's fire strategies, you're sharing risk assessments, and you're coming together to create, you know, the fire safety for the building together because you've got mm. multiple different people. So, like I said, if this was like multiple uh, commercial tenants, yes, and and we might have two systems here, um, really the fire risk assessment, everything comes from fire risk assessment. The fire risk assessor should kind of put some wording into play here about this because obviously this causes confusion. Um, so for me, it needs to be, you know, we need to see the risk assessment and two different tenants or, you know, uh, responsible persons need to talk to each other and find out, you know, what's the best solution together. Hmm. Cause I I've, just, I've just installed a fire alarm system where exactly this, you had a shared stairwell, two different tenants, and one of them wanted to go ahead with a system. And I kind of looked at it and said, yeah, but the problem is we've got other tenants there and you share the building anyway, managed to put the wheels in motion. We ended up installing the system throughout and they share it. And now they talk to each other about the maintenance, which is perfect solution. I would say that's, that's the perfect solution. Is that always achievable where you have multiple tenants? Um, so would you look mainly to the owner of the building to kind of coordinate this, this risk assessment? Yeah. And, and, and Dave, it's, it's the law. Mm, yeah. It's the law to coordinate their fire safety. Mm. It's a duty of care to cooperate and coordinate on matters arising to fire safety. It's in the reform order. Um, but I think this is a cracking one to honest you. Again, there's some really good comments um, in, in, the, in the comment section as well. But yeah. I am going to move on from this one. Holy jeez. Okay. Um, well, that's yeah. special. It's, that's a great way of putting it. Um, I mean, that photo looks like it's like... It looks it's like taken it's from the, the floor. It's like ceiling, aren't we? Because someone's up a tower. Yep, yeah, that's obviously on a site somewhere um, because I can. it looks like it's all reasonably new install. Um, obviously, the pipe lagging boys have been in and just chucked their pipes in anywhere because they can and they will. Um, it's always, you know, first first in rules. Am I right in that that's pipes. looped around that pipe? Yes, it looks like somebody's looped yeah. it around, yeah. So it can Well, premature actually... collapse straight away. <laughs> Dave, you're not thinking. Premature collapse solved. That'll hold that up, will it? Well, for about five minutes, yeah. Right. <laughs> And it's uh, if it pipe burst water system. Yeah. No, it's rubbish, isn't it? It's junk. Mm. It's, I, I'm assuming that's a modification done temporarily. Um, I can't. The trouble is, is uh, I'm not going to lie. And Dan and the lads, you go onto any commercial industrial site, you will see bodges, modifications, temporary appropriations of the fire alarm system in this manner. Mm. Um, plastic connector blocks inside a, a, junk, a joint box as a temporary 
thing where people might terminate the cables until there's a wall or somewhere where they can dress the cables down. Because th if you look at it, is that, if that's, is that two cables there? So that may be where there's a wall supposed to go. Mm. And all they've done is they've then coiled it up in some manner, put it in a through box, connected it with the intent of a lid so that they can then start belling out the wires so I mean, they can get offsite. Even though that's MICC, it looks quite new. So Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I mean, the installer, whoever connected that up, they wouldn't have done it around the pipe, would that? I mean, I mean, surely, surely they wouldn't have done that. So it almost looks like the pipe was there afterwards. The pipe fitter's apprentice, it's got to be. It's got to be the fi That's pipe fitter's apprentice. Maybe was, yeah, but then you push out of the way, wouldn't you? You, Even if it was a pipe fitter, they would push that out of the way. Apprentice might not. It's an odd one. Yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions here yeah. isn't there? i mean also you've got like in the back there there's a plastic cable tie trying to hold it together and then even cut the tail off the end of it i mean it's like it's all just sort of just thrown in isn't it and lashed together and so are we are we thinking that this is a temporary termination for testing and when and we haven't come yeah. back to it yeah there's it looks like it was taken from the floor where there's a an access tower there you can see the top of it protruding yeah the you installers. can see the unistruts on the ceiling there. you can see the unistruts you see the pipe work in you can see yeah. what looks like a sprinkler hose and a fire main and and this cabling could be for a number of things i mean that cabling it might not be for a manual core point it could be a a, a valve Yet to be installed so, on the water systems. It, it, yeah, I mean, interesting point here. Okay, it looks like work in progress as a tower as well. Maybe the pro maybe the actual image was taken because the sprinkler guys put that in. So maybe that termination's there temporarily. Mm -hmm. That system is, you know, the guys taking the picture could be. I don't know who took this picture, by the way. But the yeah, guys no doing one. taking the picture are doing the fire, and in some Pratt sprinkler firm have come and done that. Uh, and that might be the actual reason this picture's been taken. What, what worries me, Dave, is the, the, the connector block configuration tells me that the only reason someone would have done that is not just to terminate it safely, is because they're testing, testing it, because that might be part of a commission yeah. system. Yeah, it's, so temporary. to me, this looks like this is the install, and maybe that is supposed to hang down on a suspended ceiling, maybe. Yep. Um, yes. And that's why it's hanging there. And obviously, um, there's no, it's not fixed to the ceiling or anything. So this looks like it's an installation stage, um, not commissioning. So the person who comes along to fix the detector is going to turn around and say, well, Jesus Christ, what am I supposed yeah. to do with this? So uh, this, is, this, is, this, is, this isn't codable, though, really, because this, this isn't a end event, is it? Yeah, but how, or are we how, going to assume that we are seeing this now? I'm coding it. <laughs> I think the main point it. here is that pipe and the cables around it. So how, that's that's kind of the, the problem here, isn't it? Really, it's how did that pipe get through the loop of the wire? So, I, th I think I think it would be sensible to accept that this is a a construction site. But I I would I would based on my engineering judgment, if I was coding that, if it was a work in progress and that system was decommissioned, de-energized, I would say, oh, you silly idiot, you've got the pipe through it. You'll have to disconnect that pyro from the box and redress it down and, and tuck it out of the way prevent it getting damaged but if that system is being commissioned or in part commissioned then i would see to that but for me it's an fi slash c2 on, on my coding and i've just shared the poll results um and i've got it completely wrong because um 62 of everybody has said it's a c1 24 percent uh, said it's c2 um and 14 percent said fi um, if it was a, a live system and that was just a joint, a hundred percent I'd be putting a C one because it's um, you know there's no lid on it, it's not proof. The way it's hanging down mm. um, is an issue. But if it was a non-commissioned system, like you said, Paul, I'd be I'd be saying, you know, let's disconnect it and put it up how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Um, Indeed. The bigger question for me, I mean, obviously this is a, a cock up, but the bigger, the bigger question for me is why that wiring system wasn't protected during the erection from the other services. Because yeah. clearly other people have been up putting in their services and they've been within a good proximity to that system. In the comments, uh, Anthony's made a good point. Um, who knows how this happened, but a lot of sites will get work done. And in some instances, the fire engineer has not been called into the job. Um, mm. So, and that tends to happen. The fire alarm engineer only gets called in once the ceilings go up and everything else, and then you're, yeah. you're up against this. So, you know, that is quite common. Yeah. Um, John, code? Yeah, I mean, it, it's C1 if it is part of a system, but I don't, from what's in the picture, it doesn't look as if it's an actual thing that's currently in use, does it? It's sort of still under construction or something. So it, it all depends on what the actual circumstances are. So 
C1, I suppose, is okay, but obviously if it's not in use, then not really has a code, does it? So, I don't um, know. yeah. Yeah, C1 if it's live and it's in use, but um, yeah. David? Yeah, if it's in use. Um, otherwise, the question is how that service was put in with that proximity. Otherwise, it's an OP, other pillocks. Other pillocks. Oh, that's another new code. We'll do another webinar on that next year. So for everyone watching, 56010-5839, um, 26.2, with appropriate method supporting and jointing should generally be used. Please, if anyone's watching from 5839 committee, remove that generally. Um, that's just a terrible we word have, to we use. We have someone watching, don't we? We do. Yeah, Will. We do. Um, 26.2 G cable should be installed without external joints wherever practical all termination should be minimized probability of early failure well that will fail without a doubt I'm not going to read the whole thing it's 26.2 G and then 37 the nature and quality of the installation work and comply with 7671 premature collapse and the like um, I think it's a work in progress um, I think it's just been not very well looked after if it was a live system, I would go straight to a C1 as it stands as a dead system with the way my brain works. It's who the hell has done that? Is there a potential danger? Are they commissioning that at the moment? If they are and there's other trades around them, should there not be um, safe system of works in place, etc., etc.? That would send my brain into overdrive. So um, we'll move on. Next one. Get C1 back. What the hell is this? <laughs> okay. So a bit of plasterboard. We're looking from above the ceiling downward. I'm assuming we're looking above the ceiling downwards, yeah. That's not really what I would expect to see To see for an FP cable going into a fire alarm. Um, that's a bit bodgy, to be honest with you. Is that a word in 5839? Yeah, it's a bit bodgy. Does anyone know this photo? Dan, was this one of your ones? No. I, I don't know. This was one of the ones sent into our, um, our bottomless pit of fire alarms this could before we know this could be an eddie one because eddie sent me so many i've lost count to want to show you um right let's uh, relaunch the poll on this one but it's four fps uh, as far as i'm aware you don't bring four fps into one base unit or one detector or sounder um it's not exactly how a loop really works but maybe i'm wrong maybe this is a new spider junction configuration that we're all missing when is that sort of from above looking at the back of the detector or the sounder and the other two are sort of going off somewhere else perhaps yeah it does doesn't it it does it looks like they're just disappearing maybe maybe there is a like a, a surface patris there to allow some cables to loop through it on into a bit of yt maybe As i don't know said, um they have plastered the um, over the ceiling and used the base as a jb um so what he he thinks there is that that is a detector base and they've just plastered over it and it's it's just a joint box essentially. Right. So we've actually right. got an old base and we're looking from below up to it. Yeah. And it's been converted to a joint box. Yeah. So not accessible. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, you do yeah. you do see this sort of stuff. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't want to. To be honest with you, that's just embarrassing. That's. I mean, that's not a maintenance-free connection, is it? Better off just using a bloody 20 amp JB rather than one of them things. But Martin Cardis put it looks like it may be a void detector. Two of the cables go off to another unit. Also, you can see it was drilled from the other side of the plasterboard. It's, it's a weird one, isn't it? I can't really make it out. But um... yeah, it's a weird one, right? Well, I'm going to end the poll. Mm. Try and speed this up a wee bit, and I will share the results. And people have shared it as they've coded it as 25% C1. 50% of everybody says it's a C2, um, 25% FI. So decent split here, actually. I think we're all inquisitive. So I don't disagree with the FI, but for, I, I do agree. I'm going to go with it. C2 for me. Um, Dave, what, what are you coding it as? Well, I've got to go FI because I want to know more. Yeah. And if that is a connection that is no, no longer accessible, that may affect the performance of the system, C2 potentially into C1, depending on the criticality of that part of the system. Indeed. Dan, what's your um, code? If we're looking at this um, from below and we're looking up at it, then and this is being used as a joint box, then you know we haven't got fire integrity. It's a C1. Okay, good point. Very good point. Yes, breach of fire compartment. Very good point. JW. Yeah, I mean it's, it's FI definitely because what is going on there, and yeah, so probably C1 because whatever's going on there is pretty obviously incorrect in a lot of ways so so you've got this weird hole and things you can't get to and 
too many wires in the same place. So. Thank you, Doke. Right, I'm just going to. I know on the far left there, so it looks like there's paint on the cable, and and I would say I love the fact that someone's taped the ends of the cable, but you think they'd at least use the same colour tape, but that's me being really pedantic. Um, okay, so again, five sixty ten. So by the end of this, you will absolutely know five sixty ten. Um, five eight three nine. Just as some examples, twenty six point two. Appropriate methods of point and jointing. I don't think that's an appropriate method. Um, 26.2 G cable should be installed without external joints where practical terminations are accessory to minimize probability of early failure in the event of fire. I think that would probably help the spread of fire given the state of it. And then 37 nature and quality installation work. Hope guys, you can see that, that you could easily, easily uh, throw premature collapsing, good workmanship material. There's at least five or six regulations from across the standards you can throw in for most of these. Um, so yeah, don't let people say it's a no code when you're the engineer exercising your judgment. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, next one, let's 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 speed this up a wee bit. Um, I'm gonna go straight into the poll. This is just ridiculous in every way, shape or form. It's not got pink sleeving. It's not got pink sleeving. And that pink sleeve needs to be LSOH, so shame and disgrace upon them. Um, I think this one has come from our good friend, uh, Mr. Jono. Um, okay, it's insulating tape round the twisted uh, CPCs or also, um, I'd like to point FP. out here the way the cables look like, um, the, the way they're plastered into the wall there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mechanical protection. Well, and you've missed the most important thing. Countersunk screw on the one on the left. How dare they? How dare they with their countersunk screws? Sorry, you know I'm, I'm a, a hater yeah. of countersunk <clears throat> screws. Um, yeah, and it's just full of rubbish and dust. And again, ceiling from um, uh, dirt, ingress. That, to me, if I was doing that on a maintenance, I would say it has never been inspected or tested correctly, um, never mind installed correctly. So if a, if, a, if a company was to take the maintainer over on their system, Dan, and they see that that cable's buried less than 50 million, blah, 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 are they going to mention this and seek to improve it, or would they just use 5839? And does 5839 have anything that pushes towards that no, just mechanical really, protection? You advise the client, the responsible person, tell them, um, and obviously, it's it's a seven, to me that's a seven six seven one issue in terms mm -hmm. of wiring. So that's mm -hmm. what I would be highlighting for mechanical protection. So you can use five eight three nine one anyway to that reference. So for those who haven't voted, come on, guys. Um, Twenty three of you have only voted. I'm going to end this in ten seconds. You've got ten seconds to code this. This should be an obvious, it's utter rubbish. <clears throat> I'm going to see one it for the screws alone. No, it's just it's offensive on the eyes to want to show that that is a system that is it's safety. I couldn't guarantee I couldn't stand on front and judge. Just, just for the completeness of those listening, Paul, you mentioned the screws. What's your boggle? I, I, I was taught not to use countersunk screws unless you're on, on wood. Panhead, get a proper cross sectional uh, across it uh, with penny washers if you need to to spread is that the load across. suggesting there's some mechanical str strain yes. on the enclosure? Oh, yeah, because all that happens is a countersunk is designed for wood. And when it goes into that plastic, all it's going to do is warp the plastic. So you've got less point of contact on the screw. So it's easier to rip off, mm -hmm. which is just wrong. Use a pan head or a mushroom head, whatever you want to call it. Then you've got a flat cross-sectional area as much as you can on that. Even if you're using a penny washer, use a penny washer and a countersunk screw. You're using the wrong it, combination. Don't do it. To see if the manufacturer says anything about that. They probably haven't thought about it. This is old school engineering that I was taught on my second week of my apprenticeship when I started using countersunk screws and was made to go and spend two days screwing things into walls. As the other issue with the screws of those is, is not so much on the new ones, but on the old ones, particularly the slot head, is that the edge of it used to be really sharp. Yeah. So if you put it in like trunking and you put the cables in afterwards, it could actually cut into the uh, cabling. Yeah. Yeah, you need to, you need to be careful where you, I mean nowadays we get the flat pans, don't we? You can get the flat pan flat hands pans as yeah. well. But um, the, the old we screws, have, yeah, you're right, John. They did cut. The problem we have though is we have this, you know, this speed, the posies, the washers, and we just have this culture of, you know, quick, quick methods in. Yeah, yeah I see a lot of people use then you just put um, screw cups behind them mm. which just fit in the back and then it gives you a flat surface. There you go. Screw cups, that, that would definitely get my tick seal of approval. Screw cups is a great way of um, ensuring the cross-sectional area is um, is holding that. Um, so for you, is that an improvement recommended, the absence of a flat? C3, yeah, yeah. So for yeah. me, it's a C3. So that I'm would be another be observation on top of any other observations mm -hmm. when you see these. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, do, 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 right, share results. We have 69% um, saying it's a C1. 
I don't disagree with that. 27% saying it's a C2, 4% saying it's a C3. So yeah, for me, it's C1 and, and, a, and a C3, to be honest with you, but C1 for clarity, that's, that's just rubbish. Yeah. And I know people on YouTube are probably going to say, oh, you're being a bit pedantic. No, I'm not. I'm actually writing a standard banning the use of countersunk unless it's onwards. So um, I can. Simple as that, really. It's my standard. Because you can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Can. Well, I'll go for C1 on this because just with the sheer amount of junk in the back of the box, I mean, it's highly unlikely not going to work with all that stuff jammed in the back and the wires are obviously incorrectly installed and basically it's just uh, junk in every way it can be. So. Yeah. Okie doke. Right, so we're going to go for a quick straw poll. Dan's disappeared for a drink. Um, Dave, what are you going for? Same, same. Uh, I'll go Brilliant. with C1 and I'll, I'll throw in my, my observation on that screw and all. Okay, right. So I'm going to now close that poll and I'm just going to look to... Oh, 761-560-10 again is your go-to reference. That's your minimum starter regulation. Um, if you look at 5839-37.2, the entire system should conform to 761. Good workmanship materials, premature collapse, um, you know, uh, the impact. presence of dirt, foreign bodies, 522.4. Um, arrangements for earthing should be in accordance with the recommendation of manufacturer. Care should be taking continuity to screens or pink sleeving if you want. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see. Um, this key switch mechanism should be tested if by removal of the frangible element insertion of a test key. Now, if I just pushed a test key in there, that would just be full of dust and dirt and probably mm -hmm. wouldn't operate. So, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a C1. system's not working. Yeah. Hmm. Blimey. Okay. That's just two cables sticking out of a roof. Yeah, I would, um, I would assume something's about to be put in between those cables. Yeah, I, I don't actually know how this has turned up into this presentation, in fairness. I'm, if it's okay with you, I'm going to skip this one, unless, Dan, you've got an interesting story to tell. I don't know where this photo came from. All right, we'll skip this one. We will skip it, but it's nature and quality. I think it's simple. If this is left, if you go and find this on an installation, it, yes, it would fail because the system is broken. It's, again, 56010, 5839. That's just, it's just rubbish. So I'm not going to pull this if one. If I, as an electrician, going around an EIC, I put my head above a C and I see that sticking through, my yeah. assumption might be it's part of an old system that's no longer in service, that wasn't properly removed, mm -hmm. but I may not be the person right there who will then be able to go and verify the fire system is there. It's not on my yeah. maintainer. So should I push that observation? To I would code it as a C3 against 56010, saying proven recommended cable should be ripped out. Cable should be removed. Yeah. Exposed part conductive you, parts. That cable on the left is severely damaged where it comes through the... Yeah. It is, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. And it looks like they're stripping it back like you do to an earth, like pulling the yes. screen. Yes, exactly what they've done. Yeah. Okay. Right, um, Dan, this is, I think this is, is this a video? No, it's not. No, this one isn't, no. So, oh, I mean, me. this okay. is a detector in the corner of a room. Oh, right. Right. okay. Butted in the corner. Right, let's, the, the, let's the run a quick the, poll on this. The manufacturer's going to have an issue with that, isn't he? Um, well, there's an issue with 5839 part one, full stop. Mm. Okay, well, what do electricians think about this? Because that's, yes, the manufacturers will do, but for the inspectors, um, guys, code this as quick as you can, please. Um, just go with your gut. It's right in the corner of the room. Um, there is requirements in 5839 for positioning and sighting of detection, but we'll cover that in a second. And I'm going to end this polling in about five seconds. So please click your buttons. And we're going to end the poll. Right. So we're going to share the results and the results are in. 75% say it's a C1. 21% uh, say C2. Zero C3s and 4% FI. Well, I'm going to go to C1 because where it is, it's not going to work because you're not going to get the smoke even in it. So it's not going to actually do anything. So. Yeah. Okay, so here's the reason why. 56010, I don't disagree with you, John. Um, 22.3 heat and smoke detectors should not be mounted within 500 mil of any walls, partitions, or obstructions to flow of smoke and hot gases, such as structural beams and ductwork, where the obstructions are greater than 250 mil in depth. This recommendation is not applied to detectors in rooms opening onto escape routes in category L3. No eight, if an enclosed area is no horizontal dimension greater than one meter, it is impossible to comply with this recommendation. This need not be regarded as a variation if the detector is sighted as close as possible to the center of the space. Well, that friggin' well isn't. Visual inspection should be made to check whether structural occupancy changes have affected the compliance of the system. That's one that I see a lot of. 
you see old fire alarm systems and they go, how's that right next to the wall? Oh, well, that wall didn't used to be there. But again, fire engineering not being considered. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'll go with a C1 because I think the, the impact and success of that system has been quite massively impaired. Um, Dave, do you, do you agree, disagree? No, no, I'll go with the C1. Um, <clears throat> I'd also, as you just said that, there may be scenarios where it was initially fine, but then a stud wall may have moved a foot to the left coming into the room as they move people around in an office and now suddenly that distance is no longer suitable so do fire alarm engineers recheck these distances on there you're supposed to check any changes in the building that may affect the system okay and that well, think... like fabric of the building or furniture even moving around yeah or yeah change of use um aircon yeah all sorts yeah cool. That's so something... Mir Mir Mirinel has made a great observation of dead space yeah, I quite like when, that. that so, when it, so again, when there's a fire, um, smoke rises and hot air rises, but you have a dead space um, usually in corners pockets. of yeah pockets of Little air pockets where the air actually doesn't yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Next one, jeez, he, mi he missed. Common. He missed. He did yeah. miss, didn't he? He was he trying missed. to get the cables. Is that twin and earth? Nope. That's twin and earth. Yeah. Oh, this is a video. Hang on, this is a video. Right, Dan, this is your video. I'm going to press play. Watch this bad boy. Jesus wept. Right, it's a luminaire. There we go. That looks like a hospital or something because it's got a wall light on it. And... This is a medical uh, centre that I um, inspected. Uh, EICR. Okay, so we've got twin and earth there with some screws and some battens to try and get a fixing. And then what you've got then above the ceiling, I'm just going to narrate this, a hole in what looks like the fire partition or plasterboard ceiling. There's an old luminaire which has been left in, which is just such lazy, lazy crap. No, because no, eventually... that, is, that is the light pole for the room. There's yeah, um, the diffusers below. The diffusers below. Oh, you're choked. <laughs> oh, my God. That's even lazier. So they've got like plastic perspex. That's not... A, how's that even designed to any medical standard? My God. Right, let me run the poll because this is this is a fascinating one. All right, guys and girls, run. Uh, tell us what you think. Cause this... So, this, so this entire system is in twin and earth. It was wrong from day one. Then it was never never put in properly. Don't the NHS have some sort of standards? Uh, we HTM oh. all those little holes, all the diseases get in there and can't be cleaned out. Say, <laughs> John, cheer us up. <laughs> oh dear no you're right you're absolutely right um i'm um, do you know what for the sheer lashery of it that is a c1 to me yeah. i would go to town on that that eicr they'd have to drag me out of that building especially given the fact that it's a, a place for vulnerable persons or medical so, persons there's no excuse it, it, to me working in a hospital my one of my first ever voluntary roles was actually a summer in a hospital and i saw it as a position of privilege to be able to serve the healthcare of the communities and the people that are in there who needed help and doing your bit is really important, so you should have pride in the work. I'm going to end the poll, um, and lo and behold, I'm going to say it's a C1 because everybody else yeah. said it's a C1. C1. Yeah. Um, 93%, yeah. See, um, 4%, C2, 4% C3. Will Lloyd has said um, in 1988 the standards allowed for twin and earth on detection. Um, so, I mean, those detectors are clearly not from 1988. So that no. system has been modified since. So again, I if I had if I saw a system that was from 1988, I personally would be commenting on its suitability today, not from 1988, because there may have been change of use in the building. The risk is different. It, um, but there's a, an age-old thing that you can't be retrospective with um, how you sort of code things. But I, I personally disagree. Yeah. I mean, I disagree as well. I mean, fire, fire, um, premature collapse. You know, we learn new things exactly from yeah. the dangers we created that we didn't know before. Um, so yeah, uh, 1988 yeah. though is long enough, I think. Yeah, but even if that was 1988, I mean, they've, they've got the exposed cores on the back. It's not supported properly, and all the other stuff. So it's still uh, still a little old junk in that. So. so again, fifty-six zero ten. 5839.26.2 cables used for all parts of the critical signal paths for the ELV for external power supply unit and the final circuit to the main system should conform to 26.2. 
and 26.2e and compromise one of the following mineral insulated copper sheaths um cables that conform to requirements of bs 7629.1 sat the de definition of standard or enhanced fire resistance that is twin and earth that is neither cables conform to 7846 definition of enhanced mm. fire resistance that is neither and then uh, d standard fire resistant cables show a duration survival of 30 minutes that's just pants and for healthcare it's ridiculous so i'm i'm with the c1 are you all with c1 yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay well let's let's move on oof, oof, yeah, okay so that looks like twin and um pvc uh trunking that it's hanging out of is that right it looks it does look it just looks like a some yeah. fp that's hanging hanging yeah I'm okay. I'm. I'm not going to run a poll on this one because I'm mindful of time and getting through everything. But what do we just think on this one? C1. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's definitely C one because that looks like I could just grab, reach up and grab the damn thing, um, which is never a good thing. Yeah, I mean that whole structure looks to be like some kind of PVC type ceiling thing, which is in itself a bit of a fail just to have that as a structure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's all it's just, just going to fall down in seconds, isn't it? So. Although that looks like a school, doesn't it? Like um... yeah, books, library, school library, primary school, maybe or something. But again, it's this all yeah. again. You can see, yeah. I mean, I've seen this many times where there's like corridors in schools, and you see these systems going in, being thrown in, in, in sticky trunking, plastic trunking. Um, C one for me. Yeah, I'm. I'm going to go C one. I mean, um, plastic trunking and... is not an appropriate method of supporting any cable on the nope. ceiling because it's. Obviously, it just melts and falls down. In fact, you're right, because I think below that where them beams are, there is some plastic trunking. So it looks like it's fallen out. But again, 5610, 26.2, cable systems used for part of the critical signal paths uh, provide adequate method of supporting and joining. That's not adequate. So I'm going to agree with the, the C1 on it. Um, okay, we'll move on. Oh, yeah. So this, this, was, this, was, this is part of my horror collection. <laughs> Okay, so um, this is one that uh, just uh, mind boggles me, to be perfectly frank, because it's just a lashes heaven, really. Um, is that, is that, that just a loop? Yes. Um, what that is, is I believe, if I remember rightly, it was a detector and a, uh, an indicator for a void detection that was also above it. But what you've just got is loads of cables looped and looped and coiled. And my view was, well, two screws, sticking out pointy yeah, those yeah. single sheave cables should be enclosed um that just rubbish because they're getting damaged as they're going through yeah. um the actual system so i'm going to run a quick poll on this one everyone see what they think but for me that just makes the system pointless it's, it's a rubbish install it's rubbish workmanship um and i could tell you some horror stories about the attitude of the contractor that installed it um but i'm not going to on this but it was a fair cop gov was the um, admission <laughs> of the director of the company. That frustrates me though. Simple, simple behaviors like that fair cop, you know, it's like, well, it was totally, it was, yeah, this is crap and I can't deny it. And this is one of the guys, best blokes doing the install mm. completely unsupervised. And he just didn't expect on the client to, to walk around, stick his head above the scene and go, what's that? That's rubbish. Not having that. So yeah, no, these, these things can happen everywhere and anywhere. Um, totally unacceptable to be perfectly frank for me i i don't even like seeing red I, I would prefer to see a steel braided copex coming from a piece of conduit supported along a piece of stud work that is deliberately fixed to support that uh, yeah no i, I yeah you have something like that that would actually and then allow a some small level of movement 150 mil loop or 300 mil loop to allow movement of the tile that's it that's all they're getting yeah um that is not what i expect of a fire alarm system at all so um, just for the polls, I, I actually put this as a C1 um, because I can, and I will show you the results. And That's a great thing you just said, though, because I can. Yeah, people, I can. People who want to code want someone else to say why they did it. No, 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 because I can. It's, you know? it's, it's my, my rules, basically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's my engineering judgment, my interpretation of risk, and it's me standing in a dock <clears throat> trying to defend that rubbish, and I can't, and I will not allow any of my supply chain and contractors to fob me off with junk like that so 
there you go. Sorry if it doesn't tickle everyone's fancy, but hey. Um, right, C1, 56%. I totally agree. C2, 41%. Don't also disagree. It's still a fair judgment. C3, people recommend improvement. Yeah, because the system may be fine. Um, I just knew a little bit more um, about the system. Um, but yeah, that's. I, I can't necessarily disagree with the C3, an inquisitive mind. Um, but that does need a bit of work to improve it because if that's if that's a new system that's being commissioned in 2020 by the way it wasn't commissioned this year it's a few years ago now but if it was a new system being commissioned it's to me still unacceptable to leave a brand new system with all these fluffy certificates like that so yeah. i'm going to stop sharing results and we will then go straight into the standard 5610 which you all know and again you're seeing some common clauses here 26.2 supporting jointing Cable should be installed about external joints, 26.2G, and nature and quality of the work. It's just not good workmanship, nor materials, nor good practices, nor quality. Um, it's just pants. I've got a big hole in the back of my detector. Um, it's just not good enough. Um, this is a classic. I'm not going to code this one. This is about 20 years old, this one. This is the power supply for a fire alarm system. Um, you can tell where it's from because it's London Underground. There's the old Crabtree C50s there. Um, everything traffic light labelled up um, and pyro, but as you can see, quite a lot of external influences. Yeah. So, what what would we four guys code that? Hmm? Well, you've imme you've immediately got risk there that this system's not going to work properly. But it does. The system actually works. It's just on its way to failure. So for me, I would look in seven six seven one terms. Is I'm it working that. properly if it's on its way to failure? Yeah, until it, until the point of failure, it hasn't failed, has it? You well, just no, you know it's when you're, on its way. When you're testing it, you've got to assume it's suitable for continuous time. Use. Good point. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would look at that. Good and point. That's going to fail. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and I would as well. This is why I would see to it because I I see this potential danger, and at that point of failure, it then becomes an immediate danger. Yeah, immediate C one. Um, you've got so, some rust and corrosion and all sorts. Yeah, it's of crap. crap. External influences again. It's that presence of polluting substances that x you know water high humidity 522.3 um this is again a 7671 but again it's still in 5839 quality and nature of the work is it being maintained and inspected dan no that's not being maintained and inspected because if it was being maintained somebody surely would clean that or 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 treat it or do something or report it it shouldn't be picked up by a random person after 25 30 years of use not in that state so yeah, I, I for me, I, I see to that. John, your view on it? Yeah, I mean, see to. I mean, it's not it's not dangerous. Like there's not live bits hanging out. So, I mean, it's not good. But so C two would be. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not good. But yeah. Dan, um, I want to know more. <laughs> I know you do, but come on, code. Um, I'm going to say a C two from a seven six seven one perspective. God bless you, Dave. Yeah, C2, but maybe C1 if the fire alarm does not work mm. as it should. I need to, again, I need to it did work, by the way. It How much work. longer did it work? Um, it was ripped out about two months later. Right. So it was, it was actually part of an audit I did. I won't tell you where, but um, every isolated switch or protective device in 5839 should be capable of disconnecting the main supply. Um, I just think, yes, it is. Well, kind of, maybe, because those lock-off or lock-on points are now corroded up and full of junk. So potentially not under 5839 as well. So yeah, it's a system that hasn't had any TLC at all. Um, right, next one. Um, Jesus. This is just a bit of a mess really, isn't it really? I can see lots of fire breaches here. Compar is that compartment in the background? Cables in a bit. Of co I love the fact that somebody's done something in conduit here, run some mechanical protection on the cables and then just let it lay lashed for all these other cables to tangle and yeah there's this clear there's this clear this point where a fire alarm system is well erected well considered then suddenly it's like good luck and it just throws itself out onto the rest of the system yeah let's so ask everybody second fix guys uh, <laughs> you just lash it up yeah c1 c2 c3 uh, for me it's a sadly it's a c2 um, well, I think, yeah, my brain's probably an FI to start with. The, the, I could go FI C3, C2 on this if I wanted to. Um, I'm kind of torn between C3 and C2, but because it's a life safety system, I, I'm going C, C2. 
I'm questioning. I'm questioning the pigtail as well right now. Um, oh, don't even start me on the pigtails. <laughs> don't even start me. What a waste of time, effort, energy, and money. It's not a special occasion. Don't know why we need it. It's an industrial hangar. It's one of those things that ago. once you were shown how to do it, you always wanted to do one. You wanted to do pigtails. Of course you did. For the you sake get your biggest it. screwdriver, wrap it around like a bloody coil, and then just bolt it everywhere. <laughs> but you, when you look, I looked at some jobs where there were so many pigtails. You, you probably had five blokes for two weeks constantly doing pigtails. It's a total waste of money. Right, I'm going to end the poll. Okay. And we're going to see what it is. And the results are in at C1, 16%. C2, 64, C3, 16, and 4% mm. FI. Some inquisitive minds there. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm happy with C2. As long as, as long as there's no evidence of anything being more critical to the system. Uh, obviously, fire propagation, I'd want to look further at that. So I'd probably have an FI. That's another observation altogether, though. You know, we look at one yep. picture, we may see 10 things. Yes. So, you know... That so hole in the wall there, that yeah. penetration, to me, is a big no-no. Yeah, so there's other, you know, there are a couple of FIs in there. There's a couple of C3s, but C2 from the fire system itself, um, assuming that this is a void space and there's nothing that's critical being impacted there yet. So we've got, we've got again, 5610, 5839 to avoid electromagnetic interference. Recommendations, the alarm, respect to separation. Well, they did a good job in the conduit to an extent, and then they've, that's just all gone completely out the window. Um, 26.2C, cables used for all parts of the critical system should adequately resist the effects of fire. For most detection and fire alarm systems, standard fire resisting cabling um, with appropriate methods of support and jointing. It's, it kind of started well when it's just gone completely to the wind, really. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. John, what's your final code on that, mate? Yeah, I'll go for C2. Um... Dan? I'm going to say C1. Ooh. Like it. You've got the spirit of David's father in you. <laughs> David? Yeah, well, I said it's uh, lo lots of FIs. It's a C2 for me, unless there's potential evidence of it being a lot more critical. Like, the, yep. you know, the, the, the actual fitness of the system will be compromised. Then yep. I push it to C1. Right, that's good. But I need to see more. Oh, Jesus. Wept at the state of this. Um, so, yeah, this... Um, this was actually found on a site by me. Um, I remember this one, geez. Yeah, so this system was actually working and live and mm. left like that on a, on a, on a refurbishment site. Uh, the system was commissioned. It had loads and loads of alarms. Um, I went out to have a look, not as the immediate response guy, but with a, this is what's happened. And this is what we found, just cables like that. That was what we found. Uh, we're wondering why. They, they just literally packed up and buggered off. And just left everything, not realizing that there was that system was connected to another part of the building, and the building was live. that was live, yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, see so obviously, what? it's not not two forty volts system, but um, it's still yeah, it was it was pants. So I'm I'm not going to poll this one, but this is just a good practices, good quality workmanship, safe systems of work considering the impact mm. to the owners of the building if you're doing existing refurbishment construction demolition alterations making sure you have control or the contract has control over the work at all times this is if you had the office of rail regulator hsc there'd be an improvement that it's all over this straight away yeah, little things like this are evident as to why competent inspectors will always have extra brake glasses extra blank plates extra mcb blanks whatever you can hoard and you'll keep in your possession on your vehicle Yep. Um, so you can act, act with these things. So this compromised the performance of the system. So I, I see one. Di John, what was you, what's your view quickly on this? Yeah, I see one. Is the, obviously, it's not going to work, is it, in that kind of state? So. Dan? Yeah, C1. Dave? Yeah, well, I'm not going to leave it like that, and I don't need to know any more things can happen to make it knack knackered. So, yeah, C1. Again, 37 in 5839, nature and quality of the installation, maintain the integrity. Don't think that's been maintained very well. Um, and during the extent of the disablement and the system maintenance and modifications, it's just yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty poor. Um, oh God, yeah. Um, this is um, this is actually another photo from the same site. I mean, we we can poll this one if we want, but I think it speaks volumes just in the picture. How many codes can you find in one picture? Is is mm. where do you start? At the bottom there, you've got a couple of. Um... They look like they're probably isolators that with their heads removed. And removed. Wagos. Yeah, Vargos yeah, on them. Vargos, Wagos. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's just a mishmash, isn't it? This is the trouble during these sorts of projects. Is that you try conduit to, to the left on. has that fallen as some partition or wood's been taken? That has been removed for a partition. Right, so that's just dropped for now. Yep. Okay. Yeah, general builder, labourers. This is what this is the ha the hazard for construction. This is why construction is notoriously bad. Is when you allow unskilled um, mm. labourers, and I don't mean that in detriment. I mean just electrically unskilled labourers, um, uh, and near building services that are still running. Yeah, they will tend to get crowbars and pop stuff off the walls and do their bit and hopefully put it back. This is a huge. This is a huge thing you just said. You know, it's an operation. It's still running. You still got the public. You still got employees in this building, and any of these actions could. C seriously damage one of these conductors yep you know damaging their integrity even creating a risk of electric shock even um uh, at the dem same time, demolitions demolitions work should not be treated as live work many times it's not yes i don't disagree with you um you should have a your safe system work should have these systems isolated removed or a temporary one put in place so that that can be safely stripped out as part of a soft strip but yeah. not always the case um i'm going to end this poll now so please vote quickly yeah, there's tons in there to be honest with you. There's absolutely tons. There's definitely more than one code, right? I've ended it and I'm now sharing results. C1, 72% of people, 12% C2, 4% C3, lots of inquisitive minds, 12% uh, on FI. JW, um, looking yeah, at that mess. C1, just because there's so much, there's so much wrong there, isn't there? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dan? Yeah, C1, um, because, yeah, there's no system integrity. You know, we've got yeah. joint uh, isolators that don't have their covers on, um, you know, so they're effectively junk junction boxes that aren't fire rated. So if there was a fire in this room, it's going to massively affect the rest of the system. Yep. Don't disagree. Um, okay. Uh, Dave, what's your code? Yep, same C1, but I'd also, in this kind of situation, just do more investigation to understand how this had happened, and I would then write to the client a much, uh, basically a letter explaining how demolition works and systems of work and how they should have controlled this better or had better communication from their builder. Dex from Whitmore. the electrical and fire integrity perspective. Dex Wickmore has renamed FI to fuck it which um, I <laughs> yeah. quite like. Um, yeah, no, this was a, a replacement of a new system, um, just done really, really badly without any configuration control, staging, planning, thoughts. Um, it was just every man for himself, really. It was a, a horrific site to walk into. And um, but there you go. Yeah, and, and the thing is, if those were um, LV cables and they're treating them like that as well, that I mean, there's an electric shock risk. Of course there is. Um, you just, know. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complete mishmash mess. Um, so just on this one, it was cable should be installed by external joints, again, in boxes, nature and quality of the work, appropriate method of jointing and supporting should be used. Um, we're nearly there, folks, by the way. Um, last few, um, which is this, I th was this sent to us by, I can't remember who sent this, this might be an Eddy one. Um, but I'm going to relaunch the poll for this. So this is just an, uh, this it's a visual feast. This is charming. I like this one. It's a visual feast, isn't it? It's, it's just all over the shop. Fire yeah. alarm relays contains 240 volts. God bless you and your old school use of the um, 240 volt terms. Right, bottom right cable has been pulled out of the compression fitting. Yeah. Yes. Um, no protection of the cable penetrating through the... I hate to see cables drilled through mortar and no protection. They should be sleeved going through a wall. That, that is actually a requirement. The mechanical protection of cables so of course it is that's why i put 20 more pipes when i when i drill a cable for a wall i'll always bit of 20 more conduit bang up bang it through chop it at either side and then chop my cable through and then seal it either side brilliant um, there's any the movement thing is what we've got to bear in mind here this is this is a junction box and junction boxes um that aren't equipment are supposed to call? maintain the fire integrity of the of the system so you know if this is standard it would be 30 minutes and obviously this um, Sorel box or whatever is not going to do that. No, it's just a normal enclosure, isn't it? Yeah. It's um, awful. It's just a complete that, lashes paradise. That um, indicator thing is, is going to be inside the box so you can't see it when the lid's on. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Which is obviously pointless because why? 
well, the poll's over, the results are in, and 92% of everybody has said that is um, awful and a C1. I do not disagree. Um, 4% have said a C2, 0% on C3, and 4% FI. Um, yes, I definitely agree with the FI, but I, I would be recommending that system get some serious work done to it. Maybe it was in, installed at a time when standards were lower, maybe, but to me, there is no sense in putting... Uh, me, a cable like that like, through a brick wall to me oh. that looks like um they've changed the panel and they've just mm -hmm. used that box just to join everything because it wasn't quite as long and they've yeah made some additional some additions and they've just used it there that's what it yeah, looks like maybe the old panel was on the other side of the wall maybe but even even just the bending radius the kinks on that third cable from the right there it just nasty, it? and and that fourth one look at them it just looks awful they just even the glands i mean what's going on with this it's just a mess so, um, yeah, I, I don't disagree with the C1, um, JW. Yeah, I mean, C1, because there's no integrity of anything. I mean, it's all, if there was a fire, there, it's just going to melt and draw, fall apart in five seconds, isn't it? So. Okay, so, Dan? C1. Dave? Yeah, yeah, this is an example where you've got one enclosure with about 10 or so problems, and you can easily list all the little problems, but it's a C1. Um and then acting on that action should then fix a lot of the other crap. Yeah. Except for maybe the sleeving through the wall. You'd also need to add that maybe. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't even begin. Well, there you go. <laughs> 5839. You're seeing it's the same suspects again and again. Appropriate method of jointing, supporting, uh, external joints, um, you know, labeling it correctly, et cetera. Good workmanship and materials, good quality work. That's, there's nothing of that. So yeah, for me, it's a C1 every day of the week. Um, Next one, uh, this is a, I think this is a fire alarm that was at a hospital. I don't really know what's going on here. I, I thought this was sent to me as a comedic joke. So, yeah, I mean, it looks like... What, it looks like it's been repositioned and it can only go where it can go. Um, that's a nice way of putting it. It looks like somebody has put a brand new call point in, poked it through an existing hole, gone down off the ladder and gone, oh, I'm in the way of a bit of a few spur, and then just said, sod it, and I'll put a couple of clips, dress it down by the um, architrave of the door, and gone, no, I, that won't work, and then brought it out and just got the ump and said, sod it, it's going there. Because that's yep. a non-compliant height to start yep. with. Yeah. Um, it's just yeah. really bad workmanship. Also behind the door, so when the door's door. open, it's completely blocked off, isn't it? In that fire exit, yeah, that opens, yeah. Yes, let's not be pedantic, but yes, no, absolutely. Um, okay, everyone's coding it. Um, please hold quickly because we're nearly at the end of this. Builder moved it. Good question, Eddie, actually. Mm. Part M, yes. Um, uh, the, the best one is when, you, when you're in a meeting, you talk about part M. If you really want to confuse the meeting room, just say, um, please endeavour to comply with the intent of BS8300 parts one and two. And everyone says, what does that mean? You say, well, it's part M in more detail. And then they really get confused and you realise you're the only one in the room who's read the standard. It's a very good standard, by the way, both parts, very up to date. Lots of um, accessibility, inclusivity stuff in it. So, okay, I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. And lo and behold, C1, 54%, 21% uh, C2, 21% C3, 4% FI. Um, as much as it pains me, I'm going to go FIC2. John, let's go with you. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go for a C2 because it's, although it's, it's obviously, it'll still work in that position. It's just not in a, it's obviously just in the wrong place. So it's, it's not as if it's completely destroyed or not going to work. So we'll go for C2. Sure. I would want to be on site and actually look at the building. I don't know if this is a room, if it's a through room, whatever's going could on. Be, could be a school. Yeah, and the likelihood of that door blocking it, and that probably would push me to a C1. I, I, I need would to look want, at the use of it as a fire escape. I would want the managing director for the contractor stood at that door <laughs> explaining to me how and why he allowed his company to sign something off that was that bad. It does. It looks, like a, it looks like a call point that had to be moved, and it, got, it went where it went. Yes, but this is again, and, and Dan has mentioned this previously in our podcasts, the importance of taking pictures. 
you know, not just certifying to 5839, but having a record before and after you've done the install. Because if I, let's say, let's put me in the frame here. I'm, I'm an end user. I go and say, right, you, Mr. Fire Alarm Contractor, let's say Dan has installed a fire alarm for me. And I drag Dan up and go, why are you able to do that? And Dan goes, well, here's my installation commissioning sheet and all the supporting photos. I left it perfectly compliant. Ah, what happened? And then I go and ask one of my colleagues and they go, oh yeah, I think somebody put, fitted, moved it when they fitted the door. Ah, okay. So I now need to pay my fire alarm contractor to reinstate it back to where it was. It could have been somebody incompetent making an incompetent decision, incompetent communication. So it may not be. So there's, there's some real merit in actually documenting before and after. We, we keep saying in everything we do, document, document. It's really key. So just on that, that's the scores on the doors done. And I don't know why we, I think we didn't remove some of the old screen text, so forgive. Um, <clears throat> 5839, uh, manual call point should be fixed at a height of 1.4 meters above finished floor level, easy, accessible, well illuminated, conspicuous free uh, from potential obstruction. Well, that's failed on all of that. Mm. Contrasting background, yeah, get it completely. Uh, mounting height is acceptable. Well, there's a huge likelihood the first person to raise an alarm will be in a wheelchair, absolutely. Measurement should be made between the finished floor and the center point of the frangible element. I love that word. Um, figure of 1.4 is arbitrary, but reflects long established customer practice. Minor difference, less than 300 mil in mounting height to align with the mountain height of light switches. Need not be regarded as significant. A little bit of flex. And then guidance is in part M. So there you go. Um, I think we're all on a C2 with that one. Dave, you were, you were agreeing on the C2 ish? Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a C2 unless there's an issue, then I'll go with C1 if the use of it. I mean, Eddie's mentioned in the chat that if there's smoke in the room, you may not even be able to see that as well. Well, you I'd won't because it'll probably be embellished in smoke. I'd say it's a C1 mm. because, first of all, it's behind um, a door that you're going to be going through. That's a fire exit. So um, it could be blocked. You're not supposed to put manual core points behind doors. You put them... Uh, they, you know, as it says there in 20.2, they've got to be in noticeable areas. Um, the height is a problem um, because some people might not be able to, you know, reach that um, suitably as well. We have to take that into account. We always make sure they're between, you know, 1,200, 1,400. So, um, again, nature and quality installation work for anyone who's who still wants to argue that. But there's some great comments in here, Anthony, Albany. Um, yeah, there's some really good comments. Sam Cook, accountability verification, director responsibilities. Absolutely. And um, guess what, guys? We're now at the end. We're finished. Right. <laughs> We're all done. That's been a, a mega two hour odd plus session. So um, I don't know about you guys, but I just want to reiterate um, uh, Mr. Skirm, our little appeal at the start. If you do have any spare money, please go on to any of our social media profiles. There should be a link somewhere. And um, please click the Just Giving page so you can help donate. If this has been useful, even on YouTube, we'll put it in the YouTube link. Please yeah. donate accordingly. I'm going to hand it over to Dan and you guys to finish this off. Well, we've got questions as well to go through. Oh, yeah, of course we have. Yeah, sorry. Uh -huh. That's the main context of it. Questions. So yeah, I've yeah, not been yeah. looking at the questions while I've been doing this. So, uh, John, is there any questions? Yeah, there's eight at the moment on there. There's, well, there's actually 11 because um, Dan has answered a few whilst we were going through those previous things so um all right let's see what we've got yeah mark holmes has got a couple there um he's got um where fp200 or similar is installed with 230 volt ac power and lighting cables and existing floor voids in a hotel and needs to add new power or lighting cables how does he approach segregation um and i need to add new power so he's saying uh, so you've got one void so you've got one floor void that has lighting and power and you've got fp fp is installed with 230 so you've got segregation of different bands and different wiring systems yeah so um i don't think it's um i think obviously segregation we have to make sure we've got the difference between lev lv and then fire alarm mm. Which uh, 528 of BS 7671 covers. Yeah, it, it does. So you're supposed to have different yeah. segregation um, and yeah. there's many reasons for that. Mm. Um, if it, depending what 
ELV cables there are, we have installed um, fire alarm cables on, say, tray work that has ELV cables, as long as we keep them as far away as we can. And we just make note of it. And, you know, the, the designer agrees. Um, and that's, Yeah, because uh, that's in 44, where we have the risk of electromagnetic interference. Yes. So we'll obviously try to put one band on one side and one on the other. Yeah, exactly. We also, we also have a mention of it in Chapter 56, where we have to ensure that the wiring system is installed only in a way that is in the interest of the wiring system. So the fire alarm is only installed in the way that's best for the fire alarm. And it doesn't go on a different diversion because the wiring system yeah. it's mounted on is going to pick up a door curtain over there. So we want to try to keep them nice and going in there. So there's enough in BS7671 on that, I think. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, okay. Right. Um, next one, and uh, uh, Dex Whitmore's got um, where we're cutting C1. Are we fixing it there and then, given we can't leave C1s? What would a spark do if we don't have the kit to fix? So, I suppose this is about if it was like a BS771 issue, if you can't see ones generally, you want to at least try and fix them whilst you're there. Uh, yeah. So, would the same sort of thing apply to a fire alarm system? See, I mean, the way I've coded some of these C1s, um, some of these things can't be fixed there and then. Um, but if we've got things like mm. the panel isn't working, um, or we've maybe got some battery issues or something like that. We're supposed to, I mean, if you are a BAFE registered company, you are supposed to hold stock, a certain amount of stock. Um, they do check when you have an audit um, that you've got stuff on the van, you've got stuff in your stores, and um, to make sure that we can be reactive. So um, I think it depends, John. I mean, I personally, the maintenance contracts I kind of set up with my clients is that we have like a budget for remedial works whilst we're on site. So we can spend up to 300 quid without it being asked um, or questioned, providing, you know, we provide evidence and everything. Mm -hmm. I think it's an important thing to kind of have that, you know, um, that conversation with the client and a responsible person to see, you know, because that's, that's important because you don't want to have an instance where you walk away, you end up doing the report maybe two days later and they're none the wiser, you know? Indeed. Uh, can, I, can I just add as well, there is a standard BSEN 5174-1, um, which deals with distances and installation practices and quality assurance that gives recommended distances of um, uh, can, uh, data cables, telecoms cables, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is where the 50 mil gap came from. A lot of people who do commercial industrial, they're always told if you do a three compartment trunk in the middle, will be a 50 mil gap, and you're not allowed to put any cables for EMC coupling, etc., purposes depending on length of runs and stuff. Um, so yeah, generally you either uh, apply the elements of shielding or, or spacing segregation. Just going back to Dex's comment. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Moving on. Uh, right, Mark Holmes again has got uh, where a conventional system is wired in four core FP200, two cores for detectors and two for sounders. Does this still comply with BS5839 part one? <clears throat> um, so what he's saying here is that um, you've got essentially a circuit for your zones and then a circuit for your sounders. So years ago, people used to wire four cores everywhere. Nowadays, you've got two wire systems so you can put sounders on the zones. So that's not needed. Um, the problem with that, if, if you go through one four core, like let's say someone in one, one four core was cut, you're going to essentially take out two circuits. Mm. But the standard talks about zones and sounders. They're separate. So I would say if it was installed like that, it complies. Is that a recent change? Because Will's put in the chat, change in 2017 was okay in 2013, but not now. Yeah. Is, that, is that referring to this? Where yeah, because you now it, want to keep them separate. Yeah, because it, it's about one fault effect, what it affects. It's an integrity issue again. Yeah, it's it? an integrity issue, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So combine it all into one four core cable, probably not ideal, like we discussed earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. Where we have a risk of impact or damage of one cable that then compromises two separate loop systems of sounding and detection is uh, not as good for integrity as it would be if it isolated just one loop. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. Eddie Clements got, uh, surely a manual call point is more important than also the C1. I think that referred to one of the 
uh, images. Probably one, one of the images, yeah. yeah. I think these were coming in while we were talking. Sorry, I didn't look at the question bits. Yeah. Okay. And I think that it just depends on the system you've got, obviously. So Yeah, I mean, with manual core points, for me, it really does depend on utilization as well. Yeah, and who's going to use them? Can they see them? We've covered this probably in one of the last observations we've just discussed, actually. Okay. Um, Ian Malone, um, is the system just devices and wiring systems, or does the people and access devices count, such as coat racks over brake glasses, glass putting upside down and back to front? And his favourite was a system that did not include the top floor as it was not occupied. Um, well, yeah, because you, you've got, <laughs> when, when you're assessing a system, you need, to, you need to look at the application and what's happening there and the external influences. It's no different to installing um, detectors outside and it, they're affected by moisture. Mm. It, it's still an external influence, so you need to look at the building um, and see its use. And what he said, my favourite was a system that did not include a top floor as it was not occupied. Again, that comes down to poor design, really. Um, and that's why it's important. When you're installing fire alarm systems as a process, you have a specification as in what do we need to install and why. That comes usually from fire risk assessment. It could be building regulations. It could be insurance. Then you design, you install, you commission, and then you maintain. So, um, you know, there might be a reason that that top floor was not required. Um, I don't know, it might be I, I had an interesting example of this when I used to work in London. We had a training center in a building, it was a business unit. We had a ground floor and an upper floor, and we actually had the ground floor was our system. And there was a fire alarm system for us on the ground floor. And upstairs, there was this uh, birthday card company that used their own system. We were isolated from each other. They moved out after about three years or so. Uh, Paul, you'll be visiting this building in a few months, mate. And um, what happened then is this company took the lease on it. And they started moving themselves up there. But the fire alarm systems didn't talk to each other. Yeah. So, so you have one independent fire system upstairs from below. I... I went to a job with um, Tom Nargy earlier in the year, funnily enough. Um, he was doing a fit out of a pub, restaurant, club thing. And we were in the basement. And the first thing I made a gun for was a fire alarm panel. And I went, is this linked to upstairs? Um, no, it's a standalone system. But, but if there's a fire down here, how does there like nine floors above us? No, it, it's everywhere. Fire alarms, fire systems, fire safety principles have been um, have been flushed down the toilet for many years. Grenfell, sadly, was just one of many incidents that got public no, no, notoriety. Um, I'm sure there's loads more. And in fact, you know, even on the boring subject of emergency lighting, there's loads and loads of prosecutions. If you dig and look for the prosecutions, you will find them. Um, and they're all caucus because people haven't applied the proper principles or worked from the intent of the regulations. It's always, what do I need to do the minimum to get a certificate? Mm. It's a so big problem. Also, a lot of clients, they, they need a fire alarm system for whatever reason. And a lot of them will go to a fire alarm contractor or, or whoever without, stip without taking the necessary steps. The first step is the specification of what you need and why. And I get it all the time where someone comes to me and says, we want to install a fire alarm system. I'm like, cool. What fire alarm do you want to install? And they say, well, you tell me. And I'm like, well, no, it's not, that's not how it works. Yeah. You tell me what I need to install. And then I design it, install it and commission it. And, and again, it's, it's down to that, that risk assessment and getting the right person in who can assess the two different, um, and we go back to the RRO about having to coordinate with different people within the building. Mm. Yeah. There's a duty to cooperate and coordinate on it. <clears throat> um, let's move on. So le let me do this one. FP 200, uh, two times 1.5 is an overall diameter of 8.1. Minimum bending radius is 48.6 mil. I often see FP 200 has been wired through 25 mil conduit. If the conduit goes back entry, out of a conduit box there is no way this bending radius has been met this causes wrinkling the outer sheath what is your thoughts on this completely agree with you it's non-compliant this is why in london underground they do not allow this practice this is why in london underground you will have at least a four by four by four junction box um where a 25 more conduit will go into that on hospital saddles into that box to allow whatever bending radiuses are needed to be achieved um and, and in fairness, the reason I quote LUO is because they have learned more and done more for fire materials performance and fire alarm safety than most other parts of the UK because a lot of people died in horrible circumstances and they 
many years ago had the most robust fire alarm standards on the planet. Uh, and I'm not joking as well, because a lot of the construction products directive have come from London Underground Standards and the work that they did. Um, so, yeah, I don't disagree with you. Moving on. If you had to hierarchy BS5839 clauses, how you rearrange them? Mm. I don't know how to answer. Dan, that sounds like another webinar for you next year. So we're going to do a hierarchy of clauses for 7671 next year. And oh, maybe Dan can hard. do a... Uh, in all fairness, it's not that hard because, Dan, we're doing it at the moment, aren't we? We're basically looking at stuff um, and then linking it to a clause in the reform order. Um, this is just 5839 linked. Here's a challenge... Um, if Will is still, put a, put a column on the right hand side and link it to the reform order duty of care. That would make 5839 so much more robust. Again, it's an interpretation, but it kind of makes people realize that this isn't Narnia and we're not making this stuff up, but I'm sure we could do something next year. <coughs> I'm assuming call points. I'm assuming call points and detectors have some fire resistance as technically joints. Where do we stand on plastic fuse connection units for supply isolators? Right, so um, core points and fire detectors do not have the same fire resistance as, as joints. They're not fire rated in the same way. Okay. Um, ironically. Yeah, that is in a bit. bit it is yeah. interesting, isn't it? And it's the same as fire panels. They're not fire rated. But this is why, again, I'll refer to London Underground. There's, there's nothing flammable allowed, so no, no plastic spurs. No, it's, I think, actually, no, I think the core points... On London Underground, they're not plastic. They're a, they're, they're like a GRP, I think, or something. They're a, they're a lot more expensive to call points. Whatever you are. I don't think they're standard plastic ones you can get. But in terms of the, you know, a plastic uh, fuse connection unit, um, I mean, what, what you got to bear in mind is that you that's usually going to be next to the panel, and you have to have detection for the panel. Um, you know, in the same room as the panel because you want to protect the panel. So, and I, I assume there are other restrictions in the room that the panel is in, such as no storing of combustible material or liquids and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and generally it's going to be the front door. Um, you know, that's where the panel should be installed. Right. Um, and the idea is, is this is an early warning detection system to get people out of the building. So as long as it performs in that manner, that's fine. And bear in mind, if the mains does go down and it, it tears through it, you've got battery backup and you've got the system cabling and integrity so it should still sound an alert for the, you know, the duration that it's designed to. So having, I mean, the mains is sometimes an issue because we're supposed to wire back to the, as close to the origin as possible, but sometimes that isn't achievable. So it's mm -hmm. about what's practicable in that particular installation. Interesting. It's an interesting point, actually, yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think we think about that enough. Thank you for that, Ben. Um, fire rated coax. Not sure people come across that. Also used, but very rare. Popular in the eighties with fire sense version two Jerry Lloyd systems. Worth noting, I believe it never conformed to a British standard. Um, I've no experience in this. So, Dan, do you have any knowledge of this? No, I've not used fire rated coax before. Um, Sounds just as bad as SY Flex. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, no, I can't really answer that one. Um, sadly, we'll move on from that one. But... Dan, um, Dan, what colour sleeving do you use on the screening cables? Yeah, Dan. What yeah, colour do you use? Come on, Dan. Yellow. <laughs> Not pink. Not pink. You're up here, now you're down there again. <laughs> you don't want to walk into an Alex with pink sleeving wrapped around your... I must write that down as a variation. On the mm. <laughs> All right. What's this? Sam Cook, last question. Pictures of horrors like the old man states and he's a dinosaur. We've gone from electrical companies installing cable and cable containment and having a specialist contract to come in a second fix. Now we have sparks down the road. We've seen a gap in making more money and has not adopted the requirement of 58397671. I believe the fire industry in which is either very skilled or winging it. The fire industry, which is either skilled, very skilled or winging it. I merged with a company five years ago. I've been in the fire industry nearly 50 years. They've educated me as much as I've educated them. Great synergy. My question would be, is the majority of the industry is grown by experience? I.e., the bigger companies will hire people with smoke and working for clients who want tickets. BAFE as a scheme is a good scheme. However, 
would be nice to see an apprenticeship program for the fire industry alone city and guilds endorsed when we employ we usually test them on micc and see if they can terminate and end what's your opinion in moving forward to present the, prevent these issues um i'm going to do a very succinct i from what i see in the fire industry there is big problems with the uh, the quality of the installation practices some of the knowledge of the cable pulling installers i'm finding uh, fire alarm contractors have one or two good guys the rest of them are just installers um yeah that's it's it's a big problem uh, the lack of skilled resources in this country is a massive problem you've only got to go onto the dft websites or any government website and look at the um the trade skills reports or, or or the future of industry reports to see there are these massive statements on competency and the lack of and the lack of available skills and uh, and i think that's where they started the ideas of plugging it with short courses thinking that will do and it and it's just made it worse but uh, i think more more mandated CPD, I think, again, licensing, maybe, I don't know. Um, I, I, that's just my opinion, but I'll divert to the fire experts in the room. My, my opinion is, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> BS, we've, we've referred a lot today to BS 7671. We've referred a lot back to what should be a electrical engineering methodology. And to me, that's where this work should come from originally this industry should really be electricians who have trained to be electricians who then go on a further journey and reach into fire and reach into emergency lighting, reach into the event industry. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way. The industry would rather find other methods of minor, smaller training routes, quick, small, simple, off call regulated one week qualifications that don't develop the engineering that don't develop the experience and don't develop the ability to understand 7671 all of these other little niches should be bolt-ons to an electrician's life journey but there's a lot more money and a lot more opportunity if we find other ways for people to access the industry indirectly and that's why we have this issue that we've looked at today with incompetent skill incompetent craft methods incompetent selection decisions inability to assess risk uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Um, just just on this as well, I, I, I agree with you, Dave, because I think just going into the fire sector presents risk because hopefully the one thing you've learned from this is there is a, a literally a circle of synergy between 5839 and 7671. So let's just take it back to the duties of a director of a company. If you're employing unskilled labour that aren't competent in the application of 7671 or 5839, or worst case, both, then you're potentially in breach of your duties under section 16 of EAWR, section yeah. 16 of Health and Safety at Work Act, regulation three for the employer employing you and the, the duty to provide a safe workplace for them. There is so many pieces of legislation, never mind a reform order or anything like that. If you're employing unskilled workers that you're not developing and training and, and ensuring are competent, you're signing them certificates off, you're signing a, a, a just a guilty verdict in a court. And I think too many companies, and we're seeing the output of Grenfell now with the uh, insulation manufacturer who basically were just making shit up. They were lying and getting away with it and rubber stamping. And that stuff happens in our industry to this day. And we're all experienced enough to know that stuff happens. And those who says it doesn't happen because there's a badge on it, mm. then just stop kidding yourself because it does happen um and there are clients out there who want it done properly i'm one of them um i know there are other industries that want it done properly i wish it would spread more sadly we tend to have to kill people or wait for more prosecutions for this to happen but um yeah don't get me started mm. yeah andrew says that at the bottom there there is an svq3 apprenticeship in fire and security in scotland so oh. I'll, I'll do a little search and see what that's like but yeah, uh, I think, I think again, yeah, it should really be, I had to chat with a, mag a magazine a couple of weeks ago about apprenticeships. Where do they go to when they achieve theirs, you know, and they, and they should be learning and developing. These are sectors that they should then go into electricians when they've got their level three and they want to then move on up after a period of time. But people come into this industry from much quicker routes right now. Let's view Q3, I'll write that down. Yep. Um, and for those wondering, by the way, the picture on the screen, um, it's a clue our next webinar is on emergency lighting. And what we will try and do is we will do, I think we'll do a 50-50 split. Uh, we'll do 50% coding and we'll try and cover some fundamental principles of 5266. 
yeah uh, because these are specialist standards so it'd be wrong of us just to code and expect you to know so as what we've tried to do is give you the the, the little gems out of the standard to try and help develop your learning and understanding and again this will be on youtube so if you're watching it on youtube you should be able to access it screenshot it use it in, a, in any debates or arguments you're having to try and, and level yourself up and, and explain to a client that you're only trying to do your due diligence um next year other than that really guys we've got um we've got the webinars planned for schedule of items inspected which is going to be another epic um we should probably do that a weekend maybe um and we've got others planned diverted neutral currents and other bits and bobs but they'll be they'll be spread across the year we're not rushing to do them because we're going to try and do a bit more of a qualitative job on them um yeah. other than that really guys you got anything else to summarize with no uh, um well, it's just added there's the FESS in England. Thanks for that. Well, I'm going to have a look at those now and I'm going to look at their site after this. Um, Dan, thank you for your efforts today, mate. I know that this one really was kind of like dependent upon you being able to come in and lead us with your expertise on this one, mate. So thank you for yeah. your time. Yeah, no, and, and if anybody um, wants a part six webinar, let us know. Give us give us ten months to prepare it. <laughs> Dan Dan has had to go through that standard painstakingly and, and, and extract those clauses. I've learned a lot tonight. And yeah. and go through it all. And it I takes a lot awesome. more time just than slapping a photo into a slide deck to go through the standard. And and this is why the five two six six one that will take some time to go through the clauses of the standard and mm. a little bit more time, hopefully more benefit to you guys. Um so there you go. Part six, yes please. Sit down, you're on the hook now for a part six. <laughs> Sometime next year, we're being pretty flexible. Um, other than that, guys, the only thing I can ask again is for anyone who hasn't already, please donate to the Paul Skirm uh, Just Giving page. And I, I want to thank John my, and Dan and Dave, my brothers from other mothers, as always. Um, yes, any final comments? No, thank you, everyone, for your contribution. We're seeing a lot of people contributing, a lot of new names tonight. Thanks, Will, for coming in as well. John, over well, the well. links, there's another link there for Paul. Eddie, great to see you in here as well, mate. Um, hope you do, do a few more of these next year. Just find ways to kind of catch up with and each other and talk. I just want to end this on one thing. 2020 has been a really, 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 really shit year for everybody. Yeah. Um, so try and have a peaceful, a safe and a Merry Christmas for what it's worth. And um, we'll see you next year. Bye-bye now.